Hey everyone, Matt Lanfair here with Primary and Secondary. We're doing Modcast number 16 today. We have a special guest. We have the Unstoppable. I think that would be the right word. Jared Reston. We have Roland the Terrible, Long-Winded Matt, and Unintelligible Chad. So today we're going to discuss whatever pretty much comes on comes up onto our minds. Um, we're going to start out, though, with uh, some background story with Jared and uh, the incident that uh, made most of us aware of his name. All right. So you want, me start, you want me to start on that one? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> so January uh, 26, 2008, I was working off duty at a local mall. And uh, so just for people who don't know what working off duty means is, so I was, I was off technically off duty, but private businesses will hire the police. You're in full police power, your full police uniform, but the business pays you and they also pay the city for the use of their gas and, you know, things like that. So it benefits both. Um, we were alerted of a shoplifter. Uh, we weren't be able, we wouldn't be able to make it to where they were at because we were on the north side of the mall that's coming out like the south side of the mall. So we decided to bring it up on camera. As we brought it up on camera, you saw a white male and a black male exit the store. Loss prevention exits exits right behind him, identifies themselves as loss prevention. And the white male that was with them physically fought loss prevention right there. So at that time, I had to hang the phone up with my wife. Me and my partner take off running. We were trying to get out there to uh, see if anyone needed any assistance. But by the time we got there, the white male was already in custody, and they were escorting him back towards the, the mall. So we stopped and talked to loss prevention, asked them if everything's all right. They said yes. Everything's fine, but the black male also stole something, and we would like him apprehended. And I was like, all right, well, where's he at? So he points out across the parking lot about 75 yards away, there's a bus stop that's like next to the, the expressway. And the suspect separated himself kind of to see what was happening with his friends, so he points him out to us. My, me and my partner see him. He sees us see him, that big aha moment, and then boom, he takes off running, and we go give chase. So... It happened at 7.40 at night, so we had to play Frogger. There was like a six-lane expressway right there, so we had to play some Frogger to get across that and then into a parking lot of a, of a strip mall. Well, the suspect ran like straight towards the strip mall. We were cutting through the parking lot because he got caught by the strip mall and had to run along the front, so we ran through the parking lot. Right before he made the corner of the strip mall, I could see that his legs, you know, he got the wobble legs. You know, he was tired. He almost fell. And I was like, all right, I got this guy. So what my, me and my partner's SOP has always been, you know, he's a big old joker, can bench press a Mack truck, but he's got a 40 yard sprint. That's what he's got. Like, and you know, so our SOP has always been, I'll chase him. He keeps us in sight. He'll get on the radio. So I don't have to worry about it. He brings the troops in. So I told, I look over at him. We're still together at this point. I said, Hey, I'm gonna go get him. He's like, all right. So I just, you know, pick it up and go to the corner. And I draw my taser because at that point, you know, I got uh, re possible retail theft and resisting an officer somewhat. You know, he hadn't really dealt with me yet. So I rounded the corner, had my taser out, and, you know, told him to stop. Hey, we need to go back. We need to figure this out. Well, he turns around and looks at me, puts his hands up about like this, and then he just keeps walking back. I keep telling him to stop, and then shortly into that, just turns around takes off running again. So I give him a few more commands, stop, or I'm going to tase you, probably more than I typically would do on duty because I didn't know if I was fully – I don't know if it's because I didn't really want to do the paperwork, you know, for tasing somebody off, you know, or my mind wasn't right yet. Like it just wasn't – you know what I mean? Like because on duty, that dude would have been tased. So I didn't know if I flipped the switch yet. So – but he didn't stop. So I said, all right, well, he's going to get it. So I put the dot on his back, squeeze the trigger – held it there for what seemed like an eternity and nothing happened. So then I looked down at the back of my taser and the LED readouts just counting down on the back. So it's, it's gone tits up. So at that point, I'm really close to him because I was closing that gap. I had to safe it, holster it, secure it, and then go hands on with him. He was wearing a black hooded zip up sweatshirt. So when I reached out, my plan was I was going to reach out, grab him by the hood, dump him to the ground. I was going to go to the ground with him. And I want, I, I've always been good at fighting on the ground. So, like, I just wanted to, you know, be on the ground with him. So, as soon as I put my hand on that hood to dump him, he spun his right arm real high and faced and broke my grip and then came to rest facing me. 
And the key thing I remember about it is how his body was bladed and he had his hands up on his like fists covering his jaw. And I was like, boom, we're fighting. Like that's, he's in a fighting position. And that was a key thing of recognizing that I was in a fight. It wasn't someone trying to get away. So as soon as I saw that, I grabbed him from behind his head, brought him in close, and I started giving him some headbutts and some elbows to the side of the face and knee strikes, still trying to get him to go to the ground. I was going to take him to the ground. My partner would come up. We'd take him into custody. Well, seconds into that, he produced a 45 caliber Glock from somewhere on his body. I don't, I never recognized any of the signs. I didn't, I can't, well, I didn't say I couldn't see it because I didn't, but I didn't recognize them. Um, I didn't hear the shot. I didn't hear anything. I felt a heavy impact to my face. And I fell down to my left because we were on a, a dried up retention pond, about a 25 yard circumference. So you can imagine that's about four feet deep, like a sand trap pretty much, but just covered in grass. And we were on the top of it. Well, I started falling down there. And as I'm rolling down there to my left, I'm thinking, Jared, get up, get up, get up. He hit you with a good punch. Get up, get up, get up. Well, before I came to rest, my jaw was collapsed on top of itself and my teeth were laying horizontal in my mouth. So I was like, well, this is more than something. And then I look up at him. He's standing on top of the embankment, standing over top of me, shooting me. And when I recognized that I was in a gunfight, you know, I was like, oh, shit, I got something for you. Here we go. Stand by. Because, I mean, that's just how it was. So as I'm kind of orienting my body to him, drawing my gun and just probably shaking off the cobwebs a little bit, he started to walk away from me. And, like, that's where, like, he was at. Like, he thought he murdered me, and he was walking away. And, uh. So I drew, I'm laying on my back. I start shooting from my back one handed, shooting him, pushing on the ground, trying to get to my feet. So I can get into a good fighting stance. I never made it to my feet because when I sat up to that big gross movement, he saw that and kept shooting me and then came, started coming back on me. So I was engaging him fighting to get to my feet. That's one key thing that I was going to say, you got to fight to get the position. You just don't get to a perfect position. You got to fight to it. So I fought to it, got to my knees. When I got to my knee and I was fighting, I could feel the pain in my left thigh and the pain in my right buttock. And I, like, I always tell people it didn't hurt. I was just aware of it. Like I just, I could feel it and it, it wasn't, it wasn't stopping anything, but I was like, all right, I'm hit more than what I thought. So I started engaging him and he was coming straight at me. And I, every time that front sight would lay down on him, I'd give him another round, I'd give him another round, I'd give him another round. And what he started to do was kind of move off to my right. I started driving him over there and he started showing me his back, kind of like a kid, like trying to squirt you with a, with a squirt gun and you're squirting him with a hose or something. How he's trying to outrun that stream. He was showing me that. So I just, I just kept drilling him and drilling him and drilling him, but he kept coming and he kept coming. And that's the key thing that, that was instilled in me early in my career was bad guys are going to do continue to what they do when you start shooting them until you put their lights out or they decide to do it. Bullets do not knock people back. They don't do anything. So it's going to be a conscious decision on his part or it's going to be you putting his lights out. So that's, what's going to stop fights. So I just kept giving it to him, giving it to him and giving it to him. And he got close enough to me. I was like, all right, I can reach out and I can grab him. So I reached up, I lunged up, grabbed him, pulled him to my chest. So now we're kind of like belly to back. So as soon as I get him belly to back, I fall over to the side and I put the muzzle to his head and I give him three contact shots to his head. And then after that, there was like a culvert laying next to us. So I wanted, this is like where the, the training kicks in was I knew I wouldn't be able to get up and handcuff him, but I wanted to contain him somewhere and I wanted to get away from him and still keep cover on him. So what I did is I rolled him into a culvert. And I started kicking him while I'm laying on my back. I stepped kicking him into the culvert and pushing me away from the culvert, keeping cover on him until my partner could arrive. Then my partner arrived, you know, verified the suspect was dead, then came, checked on me. And that's another thing that I always laugh about is uh, kind of like when I saw my partner coming over the embankment, I got real like, oh, there's my best friend. And just I just relaxed me like, cool, we're, this is over. And he comes down, he steps right over me, and then he's over there looking for the suspect. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, he's some bitch, I'm down here shot, and you're trying to get some. But he was doing what he's supposed to do. You know, he went to pure training, kicked in, hey, I got to secure the scene before I start rendering an aid. You know, then he went up and verified the suspect was dead, came back to me, great on the radio, great buddy aid. I mean, it was awesome. It just all flowed just like, you know, every scenario you do in training. And that was, it was pretty cool. 
about how much time had passed from the time you initially began to at least try to tase the guy until your partner showed up? Probably, you know, 35 seconds, maybe. I mean, not nothing crazy, you know, from tasing him to hands on to the gun. I mean, the gunfight was probably, you know, just roughly with like split times and stuff like that, probably five to six seconds, you know, cause I fired 14 rounds or whatever. So with that, I mean, it was pretty, it was fast and furious. You had to get on it. And how many times were you struck and how many went into the armor? Okay. So I struck seven times. The first one hit uh, my jaw, exited out my neck. I took three to cross the chest in my body armor, one through my, just above my left knee and exited up like my higher thigh. Um, took one in my, my buttock, my right buttock. It came in, hit my, uh, hip cracked my hip and then just lodged right there. And then I took like a furrow through the right elbow. And you are a lefty. Yes. But I mean, that furrow wouldn't have mattered. Any. I mean, it, it was, it was a furrow. Like, you know I mean, it was just like, it just grazed me. So the, the crazy thing is this story encapsulates exactly all the things people don't want to train for. They don't want to do the one handed. They don't want to, they don't want to be in awkward positions. Uh, they don't want to shoot moving targets. This is, and and the time it took for all this to go down. This is unbelievable. Yeah, meat doesn't stand still when you shoot it. Jared, so he, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, three questions. Uh, type of handgun you had, magazine capacity of handgun. Uh, what load did you have in the weapon? I'm sorry, four questions. And you said buddy aid was rendered. Um, what buddy aid? Uh, IFAC blowout kit type materials were available or were they all field expedient? Okay. Uh, I had a Glock 22, 40 caliber. We shot uh, the Winchester Ranger SXTs, the 180 grain, uh, capacity 16. Is that all those questions? Yep. And then Buddy Aid, it was all field expedient. And it wasn't much of like, you know, he's, he's ripping stuff out and, and plugging holes because I was bleeding, but it wasn't, it wasn't a gusher. Like it didn't hit my femoral. It didn't hit anything. What, what it did for me is just how quick he went to it of like stripping my vest off and feeling under my vest. And then what the main thing was is he started running his hands down my body. Cause you know, like everyone always says, Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta feel cause people aren't going to know their shots. And I know when I took that, I was like, oh, bullshit. You're going to know when you're shot. I mean, who doesn't know they're shot? You know what I mean? Well, you don't feel it. Like, to me, like, getting shot felt eerily like Sims. Like, I can tell you that the first one was through my jaw. I could not tell you at any other point when those rounds hit me. And so that exit wound on my thigh, it was pretty big, and it was bleeding the most. And when he started running his hands down my thighs, he sunk his thumb about that deep into that wound. And by the look of his face and him – you know, pulling his hand back like that's, you know, he found that so he can sit there and, you know, tell rescue, Hey, he's got a big wound on his, on his thigh. And so it's this cool. deep. Yeah. Hey, Jared, what were you, uh, do you know what you were shot with, uh, caliber and if he was shooting ball or he was shooting some kind of hollow point. Yeah. He was shooting a 45. He had a Glock 21. He was shooting 45, uh, ball 230 grain. Where was he shot outside of the impact shots? Uh, so he took through his right side, went in his right side, tore up his liver and his intestines and his stomach, never exited um, when he was showing me his back. So if you imagine pure center mass hits right next to the spine, two dead in the spine, that's what I also talk about. Like, you know, you look at those hits and like, oh, those are pure showstoppers. Those are A-zone hits. Well, bullets do funny things when they hit meat. One did its job and pushed through and went through the ribs into the lung and then traversed up in the neck and severed the artery in the neck. So that's what I try to tell people also, you're going to spool me off. But so he was dead right there. He never even would have been transported from that scene, but he continued to walk and he continued to pull a trigger on a gun. I mean, you can live your life, you know, you can fight till the lights go out or you can, you know, cower down. He chose to fight till the lights go out. So you got to give him credit for that. But that's just something that you can do and people will think, well, yeah, well, he's dead. Well, he's dead, but he had a lot of life in him before he left and he, you know, trying to cause a lot of hate and discontent. So, but, so he had two there, 
The other one, though, punched in, hit his shoulder blade, traversed up, and came out of his trap. So it was a pure meat hit. I mean, it didn't hit any arteries. It didn't hit anything. Um, then he took two through the side of his face, one through the back of his head, and one right here in his right arm, entered in here, hit the bone, you know, dumped all the energy of the bullet right there, and then hardly entered the chest cavity. So, I mean, every shot was was good hits, but just bullets do funny things. You've got to get good, good shots and just sit there and carry it out and burn them down. Now, I remember the answer to this in a discussion we've had in the past. What do you prefer to carry? Not what, you, not what you're issued, but what do you carry? I carry a 9 millimeter. So, I mean, it's just more rounds. The, the ballistics aren't enough to change anything. You can shoot it easier. You can get more rounds on target. You carry more rounds. And that's one thing, you know, like I carry a, a 19 off duty and I carry a Terran tactical base plate, you know, and get me five more extra rounds because people need to seriously think like, you know, what do you carry every day? You know, people carry 45s or whatever. I'm like, cool. Do you bring it? Do you carry an extra mag? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like every single day. Like, you know, like when you put your board shorts on or you do whatever, you know, is it every single day? And they're like, well, you know, I'm like, bro, that's because I can do work with that gun. You know, it's got enough rounds in it. I can put that gun on and I feel safe. I like to carry an extra mag, but I'm, I'll tell you the truth. I don't carry an extra mag all the time. And it's just kind of how it is. That is just crazy. And it's, yeah, it's everything that's, that's taught that needs to be emphasized all in one package right here. Yeah, that, that's that's the crazy thing. You know, weapons are malfunctioning, going to hands-on, doing a lot of things. I mean, it's a it was an all-encompassing story. <laughs> and and the fact that you grabbed onto the de- the guy too. Yeah, well, that was um that was instilled in me by like one of my DT instructors a long time ago. Like you know, all this stuff preps you to do stuff. Then, like, you can't sit there and expect to you know, to grab someone and put your muzzle into their head. Cause to me, it wasn't like I thought about doing that. Like when I realized that was happening, like I was already falling down, like putting his head. I was like, Oh, this is getting crazy. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was just, but I've always said like, Hey, you know, you get close to me, I'm going to screw that muzzle into your ear and I'm going to let it eat. You know what I mean? That's just kind of how it is. And it was just, and that's how it was happening. Cause I've done it thousands and thousands of times. You know, people are always like, Jared, you know, do you, do you, this feeling the life leave because not a lot of people have ever killed somebody like you know hands on and you can feel the life leave. I'm like doesn't bother me at all because I've done it thousands of times in my head prior to this happening, and that's just that's the way I live my life and just I prepare for it. It's a it's a Jared. Wow. Have, 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 prior to this, had you ever gotten on the mats and played uh, scramble for the blue gun and ended ended your sparring match by? putting a blue Glock up to somebody's head. Have you, had you ever fought for the gun, got the gun and put it on somebody's head during DT tactics or in any, you're rolling with the team or, or what have you? I'd say, yeah. I mean, they I've taken a lot of the hand to hand combatives courses and a lot of like fighting over knives or fighting over guns. Like yep. it's like to me, it's like maybe not putting the gun to his head, but dumping it into his side or just putting it wherever I can get it. Like, listen, if I'm fighting over a gun, I'm fighting to kill you. Like you're fighting to kill me. I'm going to kill you. If we're fighting over a gun, this isn't, a, this isn't something silly. You know, you try to put me in a headlock, try to choke me out. Hey, I got something for you. I'm going to let it eat on you quick. So you're yeah. not going to, you're not going to beat me like that without a fight. Yeah. If I was a betting man, I, I would absolutely say that, that at some point in your training, uh, probably playing gun scramble and, and weapons retention, you would re regain control of your shit. And, uh, and giving somebody the business on the mats uh, in a very similar fashion. Because uh, it's just, it's intuitive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you adjusted any of your loadout uh, additional knives or backup weapons or anything due to the incident you were involved in? No. I mean, I, I had my knife on me then. I carry the same stuff I carry then. Um, you know, I've changed, uh, I've added knives to like my, my everyday carry. I carry a different knife, but... Other than that, you know, to me, this incident didn't change shit to me. Like all this did is validate my training. It didn't like say like, 
oh shit, I need to train more. I need to do this. It was like, cool, this shit works. Let's, let's get it going. Like, you know what I mean? Like they, they weren't lying to me. Like that's that all was, time was. That was some active problem solving. Yeah. I mean, that was my thing. It was, you know, I'm not going to, when I talk to people and teach, I was like, Hey, I'm not going to tell you anything new. This is the same things your people tell you. I'm just telling you it works and this is the right stuff to do. Hey, Jared, on the topic of you, you know, shooting that guy and thinking through your head thousands of times on the topic of that whole combat mindset thing. I mean, I was a big believer in that. Like, if you don't think about that stuff, it's not going to happen. Do you think that it can be taught to somebody or that's something that you've got to develop in your inner person? Like thinking about having to, you know, center punch somebody while they're on top of you, you know, contact shot because you're fighting for your life. I mean, that's something that, you know, you, you put a lot of value in because you went through those scenarios in your head ahead of time and just, you know, come to peace with the fact that if you've got to do that, it's cool. The coming to, the, to sort of teach somebody to do it. Yes, I believe you could teach somebody to do it. When to do it so quickly, maybe not. Like, it, it, you know, sometimes people are just a little weak minded. They might not even know what to do. And like a lot of these shootings that you see a lot, and most of the time it's a training issue. Like you almost see their, their brains, like, you know, buffering, 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 because they don't know what to do. But once you get enough training and do it, you're just going to kind of resort to it. And the mindset part comes in is, are you willing to take the time to instill that in your culture? Does that make sense? Like your mindset is not like, yeah, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm, you know, how many cops like I would have shot that dude. I'm like, Hey bro, I've seen you shoot. You couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Like, you know what I mean? Like you got to put in work to do this. It's not all about like, you know, I'll do this. I'll do that. Well, cool, bro. You, you haven't been in the gym in forever. So you wouldn't even have caught the dude that I caught. Like, you know what I mean? That's just kind of like the mindset's an encompassing thing. So giving somebody the answer that they might get to it eventually. And I think they may, or they may not because they might have, waited too long. And that's, you know, that's one of those things like when you're in a fist fight or something like that, you know, when officers wait too long to draw their gun and you're already hazy or you got hit in your face, you're too late. You're probably gonna get the gun taken away from you. You got to kind of, you got to play that boundary of what your capabilities are and let it go. I mean, so mindset, yes, it can be tactics can be taught. Mindset might not be, it's not in your genes. I don't think, but it's just kind of how you're brought up. It's a over the years type thing. Like it, it can be developed and yeah, brought out more. Yeah. Okay. So I've played contact sports. I've, I've done everything my whole life. So I've always been ready to go kind of like, so, but I, I know friends that, you know, they play contact sports and they're scared to death to fight. You know what I mean? But it is what it is. And so it's kind of almost like who's willing to hang it out there, you know, I'm willing to lose a fight. You know, I'll fight you. I'll fist fight you. I'll give everybody has a fighter's chance in a fist fight. You know what I mean? I'm just willing to almost, I'll lose to, to do it. You know, it's just what it is. As far as PT is concerned, uh, have any idea how that's assisted in your recovery? The PT you did prior. Oh, it was amazing. Cause what I think with PT, it got me to the fight. I actually believe it helped me take some of the rounds. Like it was punching in and hitting meat instead of hitting jelly. And then it kept me return the fight to him by, you know, keeping my, you know, my heart rates down a little bit and I'm not totally peaked. I'm sitting there good to go. I'm PT also gives me confidence. So I know, all right, cool. I got you. I'm gonna burn your ass down now. Like, you know, you picked the fight with the wrong dude. And you know, PT does that to people. Like, you know what I mean? It just makes you feel good about yourself and you're ready to go. So, and then it helped me in that fight. And then it helped me in the recovery, man. I was back to work six months after this happened. You know, my jaw, I had to get some reconstructive surgeries on my jaw a few times. So, I mean, altogether I was out over a year, but like I got back to work, got back to the SWAT team kicking doors. And then I'd have to take a few months off to get another surgery or something. And then, you know, it's an ongoing process, but that's, that's what it's about, man. I mean, I was back in the gym, like under 10 days after I was shot. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't any tough guy stuff. It was like my buddy, I, my jaws wired shut. My buddy like dragged me into the gym to me it was more of a mental thing. Cause like I always said, Hey, he didn't kill me that night. And he's not going to take my life. I'm not going to be someone different than I was because of this asshole. 
Like he's not going to beat me from the grave. If you had a bit of advice to give to a new cop, what would it be? Get out there and train now because you don't know when it's going to happen. And I, I think I took that from like my athletic career. It was always, you know, when you go to high school, you want to play varsity. When I went to college, I wanted to be, I wanted to start as early as I could. When I became a policeman, like I wanted to be the go-to guy quick. Like I was in the courthouse taking ground fighting classes, shooting classes, all these things, because that's the shit that matters. You know, your sergeant doesn't care if you can write a great report. He wants a dude, like if he wants to say, I can look at you and he's going to count on you to go. So I wanted to be a starter on this department before anything could happen. And that's just so, I mean, I get out and train all the time and just get your mind right, you know, and that's just, that's what does it. So whoever's willing to do that stuff will have the mindset because it's going to get in there. The people that don't have the mindset are, uh, it's, it's probably never going to happen to me. I live here that we've never had a shooting, you know, I get that, but that's, there's a, you know, we need those officers too, but you know, I'm the, I'm the in case emergency break glass kind of guy. Have you always wanted to be a cop? No, I mean, not in high school. I didn't want to be a cop. You know what I mean? I did. <laughs> my brother, my oldest brother is a police officer. He's in law enforcement. And all it took was me riding along with him. I was like 16, rode along with him. And I was like, yeah, this is the shit. This is going to be it. So. Jared, I got one of the uh, thing to hit on is the guy that you got into it with. Never been in trouble before. Didn't have a gang history or anything like that, correct? Like, by all sides, it's not something that you would expect from somebody like him. Right. And that's and that's where the training and everything comes in, and you just got to keep your mind right because, you know, it, complacency always kills you, and it's all this stuff, and I get that. And But you need to treat everybody fairly, but you need to be ready for that person to bite you. That's what I always tell people. It's not always the gang members, the – you know, fresh out of prison dudes or whatever it is. You don't know what this person's done prior to you meeting them or contacting them. So, I mean, it's just, you just got to be ready to go and you got to flip the switch. You know, it's a light switch. It's not starting an engine. We're, go, 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 go. You know, pumping the gas a little bit, putting some shit. Go, 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 go. No, bullshit. It's flipping on a light switch and you got to get it going. Like you got to go from shoplifter to murderer like that. Hey, Jared, was there any kind of uh, fallout following that? You know, I guess this kind of layers on to the previous question. Um, dude had no, like, r real record. Um, was there any kind of political community, like, fallout, or have you had to, to deal with any of that shit over the years, especially now that I hopefully you haven't, you know, and you're able to talk about it freely now, um, having had personal friends and law enforcement have dealt with that. They, you know, it's been pitchforks and torches time for them following their use of force. Yeah, man. Has it worked out for you? Uh, it's, it's, I've been in four shootings where I was a shooter. They, man, they've been awesome. Every time I've been a shooter, with this particular instance that we're talking about, his mom is a really squared away person. His dad's prior law enforcement. So, they were good people. They weren't on the media, real classy lady. I can't talk anything bad about her or say anything. And the city handled it great. So, you know, I was, the city did a bunch of fundraisers for me. Uh, I was the, the hero of Jacksonville. You know what I mean? I was police officer of the year, state of Florida's police officer of the year, president of the United States, medal of valor brought me up to DC. You know what I mean? So like to me, I always tell people like, you know, you, you got, you can't look at all this negative shit all the time. You got to look at, you know, when you do something righteous and you do some warrior acts, people respect that. Like there's only a certain number of people who can really turn it on on people and people respect it. You're, you're a special person. So don't let that, you know, deter you from doing anything. For the sake of editing and making sure we have a complete package. Um, can you say a little bit about your company? and what you guys cover. So my company is a, is a rest and group training. Um, we cover everything from firearms to, and tactics for military law enforcement and citizens. Um, 
we do special courses and CQB and everything. I mean, we run the gamut. You know, if you don't, if if it's not on the website at wrestlinggrouptraining.com, then contact us and we'll make a special class for you and we'll put it on. I mean, um, myself and the, my other instructor, Mike Hyde, we're he's been in a SWAT for over 20 years. He's been overseas. He's done a lot of stuff. We have a lot of experience and a lot of good things to bring to law enforcement. Cause that's why we started this. You know, I started resting group because like I went around talking and just doing debriefs all over the nation. You know, I'd, I'm, I'd speak a lot and do all those things. And you know, I'm just talking to police officers and like the training that they keep talking about, it's not spread evenly throughout the nation. And I'm like, you know, you're getting taught some really bad things. Like a lot of agencies might be real incestual or whatever it is. And I'm just like, Hey man, there's stuff out there and you need to get it and I'm going to bring it to you. And so that's kind of how it is. It's like, man, you can't, you can't run around doing the stuff that you're doing and expect to win a gunfight. You know, you everybody's going to win an officer involved shooting. Those are easy, but you know, so that's why we started resting group just to get everybody right kind of any open enrollment courses oh yeah we do a bunch of open enrollment courses a lot of uh all our firearms courses are, are open enrollment uh, unless an agency brings us in but you know all our firearms are open enrollment i don't teach tactics right now to civilians or anything like that i just don't want to get into that side of things understandably and then do people travel to you or do you travel travel to different venues uh, we travel all over the country and actually we've been out of the country and, and done some things. So we're international now, but, uh, um, but we, we hold classes locally and, but most of us, our courses are out somewhere else. So if you're interested, contact me, we'll work something out and, and get us up there and we'll do good things. And the website is restinggrouptraining.com. I got a ton of messages. Just people are floored by this. This is covering a lot of uh, important information that people just don't consider. Jared, do you have any open enrollment classes in the next month or two that you have locations that you can throw out there for the viewership? I guess they're interested. Um, we'll have one in St. Augustine, Florida here coming up in the next couple months of a performance gunfighting, which will be the two day pistol rifle. And it's a, it's a good combination of, of, of pistol and rifle. It's a good fighting course. Why would anyone want to go to Florida though? It's just beautiful. It's the first oldest city in the nation, baby. It's the best. Jared, out of curiosity, uh, when your, uh, when your gunfight happened, uh, how many years were you on at that time? On roughly six years. Six years right around that time? Okay. Yeah, six, seven years. And that's, you know, with that, that was my second, my second gunfight. So it was, you know, I may have been put, played a little bit into it, but not, to me it's mostly the training that paid into it. I mean, the first gunfight was, it was a pretty good one, but, you know, I wasn't hit, nobody was hit. And it's just, you know, the training side really gets into it, you know, fighting through in, not injuries, you know, you can't really fight through injuries, but you can't get a little bit of pain and be like, Oh, I'm done. You know, you got to fight through that stuff and bleed on the mat a little bit. And, and if you're fighting with your buddy and if you get bloody, that's kind of a good time. Like, you know, to, to realize how slick somebody gets when they're bloody or something like that, you know, continue that fight and push on, you know, don't quit. What kind of training were you doing up until that point? Did you have a really good departmental training program or did you seek out and go to external courses also? Uh, I went to external courses always. I mean, I have, we have a good um, department courses, but I, I've always spent my own money on training. Every year I go somewhere for five days. You know, even owning my own training company, I still go somewhere every year for five days, you know, to get my mind right, to see if what I'm putting out, you know, the industry standard and, and with the guys that I know and respect. And, you know, so I had a lot of outside training and then just, you know, and of getting it on and just knowing 
and just to me, it's like kind of reading stories about people and doing things and just being like, man, that's, that's what I want to be. I had a guy named Pete Solis was on my department and, uh, he got lit up in the nineties and like, he took it like a man, dude. I mean, he got lit up, he returned fire, attack reload. I mean, it was a gun battle for gun, all gun battles and like just watching him talk and listen to him. You know, if I was like, Hey man, if I'm ever going to get lit up, I want to take it like Pete. And that was kind of like my thing. And that's kind of what, how I want to be for people. Like, Hey, if this ever happens to me, I want to be like Jared. Cause you know, there's people out there, there's thousands of us out there that just haven't been given the opportunity to do it and shine, but they're ready to do it. So that's my thing is, you know, it don't, don't listen to all the bullshit that you got to be hurt and you got to do shit. Just get it on. Yeah. We need to set you up with Darcy. That's all there is to it. Now, uh, to turn the tables here real quick, Dwayne, Jared has a question for you. Wait, wait, huh? Something involving a belt. Oh, shit. I guess he can't. Uh, you can't this newfangled I... technology. <laughs> I'll see if I can. Nope, looks like I can't unmute him, so. <laughs> At least we can see Steve here. We'll just yeah. look at Steve. Steve looks like he's in a Marriott or something. I'm, I'm chilling. <laughs> he's always in a Marriott. Either that or in his basement. Yeah, Steve's at the courtyard right there. That's a courtyard furniture. Hang on. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah, it's been a while, Jared. I think you and I ran into each other at a conference somewhere a couple years back. I'm trying to remember which one it was. It's, yeah, one of those continuous cycles of always bumping into somebody someplace. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, actually, I'm getting ready. I'm uh, oh, I'm spending the next couple of days with uh, Dave Spaulding doing his uh, combative pistol to whatever handgun program he's got going on. Yeah. Be actually my uh, he was just in Miami doing something. This is actually I'm teaching carbine for Dave this year, but this will be uh, the first handgun class I've had with him. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. I've known Dave off and on for a bunch of years, so. You know, speaking, you know, what Jared was just speaking about, obviously, you, you know, getting out and getting more, you know, being an instructor as well, having your own training company, it's always tough getting out to do your own time behind the line. You know, it, it's always hard. I've been lucky enough this year. I've got Spalding coming in. I'm doing one or two with Jeff Gonzalez this year. Again, and a few other guys just to get behind the gun again, you, you know, without – as you know, getting there and trying to push yourself on a range to do more. And it's like you can only go so far. Oh yeah. yeah. Though Steve, I got to say, I'm a bit disappointed you're not wearing a vest. I know, right? <laughs> Hold on, I, uh, I, I can uh, find one real quick. If I can find one real quick, or I can cut the sleeves off my jacket or something. <laughs> a lot of people are disappointed. They they ordered that vest and you showed up without it. Way to be a letdown fish. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. Anybody hear me now? Dwayne's back. Kinda. Anybody hear me? No. Yeah, kinda. Yeah, I can turn up your volume a little. All right. That's better. All right. You heard me spill ammunition all over the table? Mm -hmm. Sound like AA batteries. <laughs> I see Magpul can't afford a nicer camera. I know. <laughs> Oh, so, I, yeah, uh, technology at its finest. My work laptop is actually sitting right next to me in a state of complete disarray for the past 20 minutes as I'm trying to log on in complete and utter failure. So it's locked up. Um, so I'm on uh, standby, backup. 1990s technology. Did you try power cycling? That's just number one thing I was you about do with technology. To, yeah, I was about to try ball-peen hammer. Uh, is where I was at after cycling everything known to mankind. <laughs> hey, D Wayne, is Magpul Main uh, running Windows, or are you guys running Apple like Magpul North? Uh, so it, it 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 depends. We've got a lot of folks, which which leads to more problems. Is we've got a lot of people on Macs and we've got a lot of people on PCs, but the main system is on PCs due to our reporting and. Uh, yeah, so your your work machine there is it a Windows machine or is that a Mac? It's a Windows machine. Okay. Yeah, I can't imagine what try, I'm trying to do Google's Hangout on on an Apple device. <laughs> yeah, 
No, it's all good. Mine's a, it's a Windows machine. It's just a terrible Windows machine. It, it works about 60% of the time. It works every time. Nice. So apologies for being late, but uh, I am here. <laughs> so, yeah, Jared had a question for you. I'm not going to ask. Right. <laughs> no, is it good? What? What do we got? Uh, no, it's not a good question. <clears throat> I think it had to do something with some gear. Though, he wasn't familiar with uh, Magpul gloves. What? Oh. I was not. Oh, dude, the gloves are legit. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I was, I was, I didn't, know, I didn't know about them. I'm still, wor- I'm still waiting for my Tejas belt to come. What? Oh, guy, what? guy got a good See, shot in the a... face around here to get some gloves, or what? <laughs> 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 no, you just got to call Knipe. Oh wait. Now, whoever doesn't have gloves, send me a doggone email. And let me know what you want, what size, and. Uh... Make that happen. <laughs> we even make double extra Sasquatch for yes. Steve. I'm, I'm waiting on the ranch gloves. I actually just put an order in for a set of the ranch gloves. I'm excited about Did you just spill your drink? No, I spilled M852 <laughs> all over the floor. <laughs> now it's double A batteries. This is, why you, this is why you don't have a belt or gloves, Jared. Yeah, there it is. There's my double A battery. <laughs> my, belt, you know, this is a, my belt money went to a good camera for him. It's, it's next to, it's right beside <laughs> that finger. <laughs> I feel like I'm looking at him like on a Super Nintendo. This is 16 bit. Uh, you can play Duck Hunt on this. No, so belts. Was there a question about belts? Yeah, I, was, I was just giving him a hard time. I ordered a belt a while ago. It, it'll be here. I'm not. Oh, uh, okay. So, were you uh, a somewhere around the between the 32 and 38 size curve? Yes. Yeah. So, those disappeared pretty quick. Uh, we they're making more every day. Uh, that's one of those. So, right in the center of the bell curve, we got hammered on. But uh, they're made right here in uh, in Texas. So it's uh, it's down the street, and they deliver. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Two weeks ago, it was it was in the order of the warehouse, and it was getting overnighted to me the next day. Still waiting. Oh, no kidding. I'm waiting for it. It's going to be nice when I get it, though. All right. Send me an email about the details. <laughs> I'm, not this. I'm not bitching, bro. I'm just... No, 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 no. But this is the kind of thing that I don't like to see happen. This is no. So somebody's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to greet someone tomorrow morning with an unpleasant phone call. No. Well, you ain't getting I ain't getting information out of me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> This is already being recorded, dog. I got news for you. Yeah, I know. I know. It, um, it's, it's fine. Everything's great. My belt's coming. It's going to be nice. <laughs> hey, Lanfair, you got his email? We can send an email on his behalf. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I already created uh, Jared Reston at primary and secondary. I'll be sending it in. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, watch out. You got some traffic getting behind you. you oh, back? yeah. Shocky? Shocky, there's a construction worker in your house. <laughs> yeah. Better than the mailman. <laughs> That's the dancer thing. It's fucking interesting around here. It's like the village people in this bitch. <laughs> so we, so uh, what are... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just... Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can make this camera not look like 1975 with an 8 millimeter. It kind of looks like a NASA shuttle feed from the 80s. It does. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Ground control. <laughs> oh. You could do the Roland method and just turn off your video, yeah. but then we can't see you. Nobody will believe that it's actually me. Well, there's nothing to see here. Nobody will believe it's actually me. <laughs> oh, you know you didn't tell everybody because this is live. You told everybody just to email you about gloves. <laughs> yeah. All right. I did. Everybody on Everyone. this. <laughs> right now, everybody, right now. <laughs> right now. So, with that in mind, so Jared isn't overly familiar with the Magpul gloves. I think it might be time for a Magpul glove plug. Let's hear one, about them. One moment, just give me Excellent. like three seconds. Let's go get a Nintendo Power glove. That's so, right. The gloves are make some phone calls about these gloves. The, the, the gloves are absolutely awesome. I, he should uh, totally act like he's floating right now. The, the breacher gloves? The breacher gloves are legit. Are they? Yeah. 
right. How's the dexterity on them? Good? The dexterity is really good in the gloves that I've got so far. I've got a set of the breachers and a set of the tactical whatever they are. And the dexterity is really good on them. I've, I've got huge meat hooks. I normally wear like a 2XL. Yeah, um, I got a set of the XLs, and they are like right there because you know I always you always kind of want to downsize a little bit so they're tighter fit, but th they're they're phenomenal. The dexterity's been really good. I haven't had any issues with shooting with them. Uh, we ran the breachers gloves uh, down in Alliance, Ohio, when I did the uh, the that segment that we did for Rainbow Six of Siege. Uh, we passed them around for guys, you, you know, doing mechanical explosive thermal breach. Everybody dug them. They actually have my pair down there right now. They're going to use it at the breaching school. They're teaching for like a week in April, and they're just going to kind of pass them around to guys that are there from all the agencies and let them beat them up some more unless Dwayne gets me a couple more sets to give out for those guys to use and try out. No, I can do that easy. Um, bottom line on the gloves, we just uh, just kind of the, one of those things where we started looking to expand into the soft goods world a little bit and, and dip our toe in the water, but... Uh, just because we had some contacts that had the capability to do this, this stuff right and source these things appropriately. I mean, U.S. made gloves are a frustrated exercise in futility. We tried doing that, and it's just you get – they look like they were made a lighthouse for the blind, so they're, it's not a, not a good deal. So these are uh, made in one of the best glove factories in the world. They've made some of the uh, gloves that you've uh, all probably worn. <clears throat> but we went and we took a look at uh, – some of the problems with uh, other gloves and some things we could improve on. And we came out with a line of gloves. And the ranch glove was, it's actually one of the favorites internally as well as externally. The ranch glove is one of those things where uh, is is just, hey, let's, uh, as we dealt with all the pros we had in different categories of gloves, one of them was like the Wells Lamont, you know, rancher glove. No kidding that everybody has under the seat of their truck and they never fit right and, you have absolutely no dexterity, but you need a, a, a complete, tough, you know, no kidding work glove. And, and so that one was born out of that. All of them uh, have this uh, neat little leather that is actually touch-sensitive leather. There's no strings or thread or any kind of craziness in there. All the, 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 the transmittive material or the conductive material is in the leather itself. So uh, they work really great on all kind of touchscreen devices, and that's three, you know, two fingers, index, uh, uh, middle, and your thumb as well. On all the gloves have that, with the exception of the ranch glove, and we use threads on the ranch glove. But uh, we started down with uh, a flight glove, which is FR, has uh, some changes in how the leather runs. Finger construction is all rollover tips on uh, almost everything except for the technical glove. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly standard glo uh, flight glove with a little bit extra... Uh, leather coverage one because they always all the gloves blow out right in the crotch of your hand right so from grabbing stuff from shooting that's where 99% of the failure modes of gloves are right in that point so all of them have rollover protection in there double layer triple layer uh, protection there with the exception of the technical technical which is a really really lightweight and this one is meant to be kind of a, a contact glove or extremely tactile glove and this thing fits like a glove um, so really, really high dexterity, and this one's all synthetic, and the rest of them are all uh, premium leather palms and, and such like that, or, or double layer uh, leather palms, like the breech glove. We did a little more anthropomorphic uh, knuckle that wasn't quite so stylistic. It's not that much big of, uh, of a departure, uh, but it's good leather. We reinforced them wherever we saw failures and everything uh, and anything else. We did rollover finger or rollover uh, tips on all the fingers so that. Uh, Dexterity is there so you're not fighting through a seam to try and grab stuff or feel anything with the tips of your fingers. Um, and just uh, played with these things quite a bit until we got gloves that we liked. So we make the technical, the flight, the patrol, which is a uh, padded knuckle glove, which doesn't have a hard knuckle. The technical is a real light, like I said, tactile glove. The uh, And then the breech comes in FR and non-FR. The non-FR is uh, what you see here, and then the FR is actually just the you know a little pricier, but uh, it's all uh, Nomex, of course, except for the the leather portions. That's uh, that's the glove story. So how with the technicals? How is the uh, like the heat resistance on it? So it's an all synthetic glove, and it's not like uh, <clears throat> so it's flash resistant. It's, it's not something that I would – it's certainly not an FR glove, 
but it's not something that's going to flash up in your face either. You know, um, I run them. If you're talking about running a, uh, uh, you know, running a firearm with them, uh, I've used these quite extensively. Uh, running AKs or high round counts, uh, uh, you know, skinny tubes on an AR, and they're <coughs> pretty darn good at that. And you lose almost no dexterity with these guys. They won't be as durable over, you know, long, long, long periods because they are an all-synthetic glove uh, as some of the other ones. But uh, this this pair right here, I've been actually beating the heck out of for quite a while, and there's still not even a single, you know, thread popped out of a stitch so or out of a seam. So That's cool. Like, what about like, a kind of extraction device pretty quickly after it goes off? You think you'd be able to handle it? Feel warmth so, through the glove, but be able to handle it probably? Yeah, yeah, I... I think there'd be no problem whatsoever the synthetic leather leather is, is real good with, with that sort of thing uh i would i would certainly pick up a banger after letting it go off all right and are they all readily available to purchase they're all uh direct on the website we have some distribution uh that's going out right now but we've kept that kind of limited just because we don't want to end up without gloves and we have more coming over right now. The, the the gloves in colors. The colors look really cool. We have all black right now. The technical gloves are available in colors, and before the end of March, all of the other colors will be available. So you'll see the uh, uh, the FDE or Coyote color in the uh, and as well as a gray color in all the gloves except for the flight glove. And the flight glove will be available only in black and and then a sage and gray. Very traditional. Uh, color pattern on that one. That's Jared, have a couple questions that have come in for you. Are you ready? I got a couple answers for them. Excellent. Uh, first off, do you shoot competition? Yes. It's a Competition is a great way to induce stress, to inoculate yourself to stress if you're trying to win and trying to do good things. So I shoot um, two gun. I shot my first professional three gun match for TNBC sponsored last year. And, um, so shoot two gun, three gun, um, with local matches with pistols as much as I can, because I mean, there's flat range, there's competition, then there's force on force. Like, that's the only things that can prepare you for the stress that you're going to feel. And you got to have it. And people who don't do it and kind of, like you're always getting like the whole tactical and the, the competition world. Well, you know, if I want to be the best fighter in the world, I can't ignore a boxer or whatever he's saying. Like, so I can't ignore like what these competition shoes, cause their job, their whole goal in life is fast and accurate. So what they're doing is getting that stuff there, but what is it? So, if I'm getting juice for the squeeze, then I'm going to do what they're doing. If it's not tactically, you know, unsafe or, you know, I can't have that with my guns. I, you know what I mean? So there's certain ways that you can run things, but competition is a must. You've got to have it. You've got to do it. It's, it's the, it's, it's a no brainer to me. I don't know why more police or, or anyone doesn't do it. It's just, that's part of mindset and training. It's funny how much, how much truth you're saying and how much, I've heard the opposite from veteran cops that seem to think they know better. <laughs> they don't. No, they don't. Um, are you? Do you do any martial arts outside of uh, cop DT type stuff? Um, no, I used to train with combatives a lot, and I, I still don't do like a set martial arts. But once a week, I'm with a guy on my team who runs our combatives program. You know, banging it out on the mats, trying to do things. I'm trying to limit my going to the ground now to more a stand up capability because, you know, going on the ground is not a great idea. Like, you know, and I, and I realize that now that, you know, hey, I want to get some bang, 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 create some distance, protect my equipment. And if I got to go to a gun, then that's that's where I want to be. I want to be a little bit more distant. So now I'm working on my stand up game way more than I did before where I counted on, you know, just wrestling and using my size to lay on a joker. Yeah. What is your PT based? Uh, the question or the uh, person asking the question asked if you, if your PT is based on football. No. So, I mean, 
I played defensive end when I was in football, so I was 270-something pounds. Then then when I got on the law enforcement, I almost didn't make the academy because I couldn't run a mile and a half in 15 minutes. So it was like, well, shit. So I had to bring it down to that. And then when I got into the academy, you know, the SWAT guys came, they did their demonstration. I was like, oh, that's me. So then I had to drop from 270. I dropped down to 210 to make the SWAT team because I got to compete with little ninjas that can jump over stuff and do things. And uh, so I'm back up to about 235 now, like just with with size and just getting older. So my my PT is – it's not CrossFit because I think, you know, CrossFit – especially at my age is going to get me hurt. So I do you know, more Olympic lifts, um, being strong, but still keeping my cardio. I don't run as much anymore because my joints hurt. So I do a lot of rowing. I just keep my cardio right. Make sure my strength's right. Cause you know, I always say this, you don't want to be the best runner in the world. Cause you're just going to be the first one there to get your ass kicked. And then you don't want to be the strongest dude in the world. Cause you might not make it to the fight. You know what I mean? So you gotta have a balance. You gotta be decent at both at both. Well, clearly you're not CrossFit because you haven't mentioned it at all. So, yeah. <laughs> and this, this question I especially liked, um, with Reston group, with, with the training that you provide, what is the biggest efficiency you're seeing with cops in their training? Their efficiency or deficiency? Deficiency. That they don't train. Most, most police departments do not have a firearms training program. They have a recall, you know, set up and do program. There's not very much in the much of training going on in law enforcement. It's just all, you know, the TAC guys get it. But a lot of people get it, but they don't – they might even have open range days and things like that, but no one's getting enticed to go. I mean, we've gotten away from – like I, I walk down the, the hallway of my police department and you can see like back in the, in the day, you know, you see those trophies with a dude, like the bullseyes. And like, that's just what cops did. They shot guns and they were, that was like the teams that they had. And then you get further on. And now like since 2000, it's a bunch of like golf trophies. Like, Oh, we're going out onto the range and we're doing this. And you know what I mean? It's, Hey man, that's not what it's about. It's about being a man and sitting there and, and shooting guns and, fist fighting and driving fast. You know, that's just kind of what it's about. You have no idea how cool this is. Everything you, you're talking about is completely in line with everyone on this panel. We are, there's so much agreement going on right now. Like I said, you, I'm not going to teach anything. I'm not going to say anything new. I just, I'm a believer in what, what works. Unfortunately, there's not enough of that though. There's not enough. There aren't enough people bringing up these things. There aren't enough crusaders for these truths. There, there are, and this is what I'm going to say about law enforcement. If I was not a police officer when 9-11 happened, I would never be a police officer. I'd be in the military because that's just kind of when, how it was with me. If, you know, I, I'm not from a military family. I didn't know, like, you know, with Delta Force and, you know, Navy SEALs, that wasn't big. So with me, if you wanted to get into a gunfight and you wanted to do cool shit, you went to a Metropolitan SWAT team. And that, that's, that was it. So after September 11th, you know, I got the calling. I wanted to go bad and just didn't go. So many good men. I mean, there's so many warriors. Out. Like people are like, oh, the police are pussies now. I'm like, hey, bro, like our army, our military is the baddest fighting force in the freaking world. Like we would fucking wreck house. So you can't take those dudes. So now that it's slowing down a little bit, I think we're going to get some of those dudes back to law enforcement. That calling is going to come back. So we're going to have a gap, but they were over there doing good work. So you can't sit there and fault anybody. So we're going to get the men back. How do you think it's changed these days though, with the threat of legal litigation and also the media scrutiny and people being afraid to, pull the proverbial trigger and, and be more hands-on and that's going to lead to more cops being hurt because of the temperament of the country. I know the country right now towards police officers. To me, it's a media thing. Everyone wants to say there's a war on law enforcement, which I think is kind of bullshit. There's not a war on law enforcement. There's a small percentage of fucking idiots that hate us, but they hated us beforehand, but they're now they're just getting media. So everybody hate, I mean, 
if you look at the numbers, the numbers are around the same throughout the nation. You know, we're, we're losing 110, you know, 120 all the time. You know, just you go back to like the 70s and the 60s when, you know, they were killing police and they hated, you know, we're just in that area right now. They just, they hate us again. That's just all it was. They hated us in the 60s, 70s came around, the 80s, they loved us, 90s are good, 2000s, you know, they're hating us again. It is, it's just a cycle. So there, there's not a, you know, you look at all the recent deaths and people are like, oh, you know, when's this going to end? It's never going to fucking end. If it ends, I'm not going to be a policeman because if I wanted to be a tax guy, look, that's what makes us heroes is that we put a vest on every day and we put, we put our uniform on and go do work. So I don't ever want it to end. This job is a service that I'm providing people that who can't do it. So that's what it's about. Like, so the people who talk like that are the same people who don't train. They don't do it. It's an excuse. Look, and they've never pulled a trigger on somebody. I've, I'm going to tell you right now. The first time someone pulls a gun on you and tries to shoot you, you're not going to say, hey, what the hell is the media going to do with this? You're going to pull your gun out and you're going to shoot them. And if you or you're going to shoot at them if you're not properly trained. It's all about the training and getting right. Did that answer that one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yep. What's next? Yeah, whatever. We're giving Prime his uh, editing break right here. That's right, because editing is so much easier when we have these nice pauses. Oh. They're natural pauses. Yep, oh, someone's going to off themselves. No, I bought a new blaster today. Is it Roland's? No, it's mine. It's another 1911. That's just what you needed. 27 rounds, dog. Nine millimeter. <laughs> So what's that bring your count to now, Fish, for guns owned? All of them. <laughs> you lost track. <laughs> enough that when it becomes time, I've got enough money to buy a small third world nation and move all you clowns to. But remember, I only shoot like four. <laughs> this is a guy living up in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. We have fun in Detroit. You, you live in a third world nation. <laughs> I do. There's no doubt about that. It's like Beirut North. <laughs> Bill just posted a really good comment talking about law enforcement. It, 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 and it goes something like this. What cops need to realize is that if a bad guy takes you down and stays in that fight, he's not trying to disengage to escape. He's trying to kill you. It's time to shift gears. Well, there's absolutely a, a switch flipping time that's, uh, I guess, uh, mandatory in uh, any of the unarmed uh, combatives type stuff and some people are hesitant to, to, swip, to flip it. You can't be because that's the, that's the problem. There's a game in Scott to some extent. Yeah, there's an escalation of force moment but there's that, that point and that's exactly how we used to describe it as the paradigm is when, when the game time switch gets flipped and somebody's trying to kill you and then it's 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 game on I think a lot of people um, it's all dependent on mindset and what they've been uh, subjected to or what they've experienced everything compiles together but people everybody sets a mental trigger somehow some way some more definite than others and some people set mental triggers going in the wrong direction um, their mental trigger is I'm going to keep pointing my gun at them and tell them to stop until they stop. They have their, they have their switches, you know, plugged in the wrong direction or something. Um, whereas others like, you know, Jared, probably a few others in this chat right now, they set their mental triggers um, for the escalation, not the de-escalation. That's just what I've personally seen. The vapor lock. Yeah, and they start playing that tape over and over again. Keep repeating it, and they don't get that answer. That they want. There's there's an expectation that when they've they, they've done that certain certain act or they they've gone to this certain point that everything is going to be cool and they're not going to have to go past that. And unfortunately, when it does, then they're ill prepared to be able to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of 
teaching a basic carbine course and have seeing a SWAT guy having issues and the gun isn't going off. He doesn't know what's going on and he's completely vapor locked. There's a, yeah, exactly. There's a safety. That little selector thingy that makes the gun yeah. go loud. Yeah. yeah. That's a cool. Thing. Loudener. The loudener. loudener. And let me say, Chad, it's great to be able to hear you. Awesome. You can thank my wife. We're, we're going to get some really good feedback on that. We can hear awesome. Chad. Oh, he makes sense. That's going to last for like 30 seconds. I'm like, fucking shut this guy up. Already. I'm going to make one disclaimer. Also, not all SWATs are created equal. So, yeah. So, well, we can't go that crazy with the safety selector. But... <laughs> hey, Jared. Um, Might have missed it, the details earlier. Um, were you carrying on your, on your Glock 22, did you have a weapon man at light? Yes. Uh, and you're using tritium sites, whatever. Was no, um, see, that, that was, that's a big lesson learned right there. So the Glock I was carrying was a stock Glock 22 with a TLR on it. And why it was stock and had bullshit Glock sites on it, just the plastic, was because I also trained at the academy. And when I shot, I didn't want a student to say, well, you got fancy sights, or you have this, or you have this. So I kept it as stock as I, it, what it, it could be, and I carried it off-duty because nothing happens off-duty. You know, the gun that I carry every day, before, like, you know, my concealed carry gun was more ready for a gunfight than that gun was just because it was just that gun. And that was my bad, and that was a mistake that I made. And, you know, I'll tell you right now, for a – for a fighting gun, metal sights, preferably with trinium, some sort of grip done with grip tape or either stippled is an absolute must on anything. Because, I mean, a grip is, you know, recoil management is probably the most overlooked fundamental on shooting people and that, that, you, can, that you see in courses. And it's just that's – that's what it's about is being, you know, the first shot's the hardest. If you have good grip and good recoil management, the second one just fall right back down to place and you just keep giving it to them and giving it to them. You don't want to have to repeat the first shot over and over and over again. And you don't want to be doing the officer or detective Murtaugh thing. Yeah. Strong hand only. Yeah. Right. So, but how, if you were to have had, uh, uh, or, given the opportunity or the, just the muscle memory of hitting it, did, did you employ your white light in that whole situation or was it just straight up using backlighting on him or available light? I didn't, but it was dark, but there was a street light above me. I didn't use the light cause I could see my sights, but what the light did, which was awesome on a Glock 22, it, it sticks out about a quarter inch past the muzzle. So when ah. I drove that gun to his head, it kept the, kept it off there and let the gun work. So, I mean, it didn't work in its traditional sense, but it worked for me fabulously. It was a great standoff. A standoff, yeah. yeah. Mm, I like it. <clears throat> Bill has another question for you in regards to your SWAT team. Uh, what's your training cycle and your op tempo? Uh, our training cycle is every Thursday we train, and then two weeks a year we do five days of training. So we're, we train a lot, and our op tempo is really high. We average over 150 missions a year. So, I mean, we're, we're shitting and getting. We, um, we're not – I mean, I guess we're not innovative, but we are in the high end of SWAT teams of, of doing things, you know, doing the right things. So – If anyone has any questions, feel free. That includes Jim Santoro, who's asleep. Oh, Jim, I think your audio is off. Yeah, you have no audio. Zero. 
Get him the crayons. Yeah. Why is it, why is it going to be that way? <laughs> it's just how it always ends up that way. Plus, it's usually my internet, so. That is Here, true. You got any lasting uh, injuries or pain or anything still associated with all the shooting, or have you healed up as close to 100% as you can get? I mean, as close to 100% as I can get, but my hip still hurts. Um, I have no feeling like my from my bottom lip all the way down. Like I, I have a goatee of numbness pretty much. So the more of these I have, I start to drool a little bit. So I hate to – if I drool, just, just laugh like everybody else does. But, you know, it's just kind of – it is what it is, you know. That's what I tell people. Don't, like, feel sorry for me or anything like that because there's people way worse off than me, man. I'm – I have fun. I'm living life. So just, you know, beat but, the hell out of a lot of the possible alternatives. Yeah. Without a doubt. And you know, yeah, it hurts, but this is the, this is what, like when people say you're a hero for what you did, no, it's not what a hero what you, for what you do. So what a hero you continue to do and you do every single day. It's not one little act that makes somebody a hero. It's the, someone that knows what the hell that they face and they continue to do it. And like, you know, I mean, I'm not, I don't ever say like, Hey, I'm a hero or whatever it is, you know, but there needs to be more heroes in this world. I, I think in law enforcement, we always, they, they preach kind of the, the, Hey, uh, you know, just don't be seen, just do your thing. Just keep going, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, screw that, man. You go out and be a fucking hero, be something awesome. Like, you know what I mean? Like do something, risk your life. Cause that's what you're doing every single day. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, some people say, oh, well, you know, I'm never going to get into it. I was like, hey, man, every time you go on duty or whatever, you know, you're putting your name into a hat. If you're if it gets drawn, you got to do it. I mean, you're putting the same sacrifice out there. You're giving it. So you might as well be trained to be able to, to give it back. Hey, Jared, you said you had you've had what, six? shoots no I've had, I've had four where i'm a shooter um in 15 shooting around me would you consider yourself a shit magnet or just kind of lucky yeah well, one of the like, like funny story so a few years ago i got into a shooting we had a guy who murdered his brother his brother's best friend Tried to kill his dad and his mom, you know, blew her arm off, shot her. I mean, modern medicine kept them alive. Then disappeared in the woods. So we had a manhunt over like like 15,000 acres or something in the woods, and we were looking for him. So we kind of break that down, but we keep a uh, reactionary force close by, you know, just driving around. If we get calls, we'll go. We'll go. So we get called to a farm and says, hey, my dog has been acting funny. She was, he was barking over there, came back. The dog has blood on him, but the dog's not cut. So I don't know what's going on. So we searched this whole property. It's a big property. Nice. They use it to do weddings and stuff. Has like a big covered bridge and nothing. And we're just sitting there talking and the canine guy starts kind of walking off. He's like, Hey, I'm gonna go check down here. And I was like, well, I'll come with you. You know what I mean? And as soon as I, I went to go check, like my, this guy's like, if you're going, I'm going. Cause he's like, you know, he's like, something's going to happen. <laughs> so we went down there and old boy was hiding in a boat that was parked down there in the woods, like discarded in there. And we, we had to burn him down. So, you know what I mean? It was just like, he's just like, you know, if you're going, I'm going cause shit's going to happen. And it's not that it's not that I'm a shit magnet. I look for shit. That's what it is. You know, if, if you're a snake handler, you're going to get bit by snakes. That's just how it is. You know, if you're beating the bushes, this shit's going to come out. I mean, evil's in this world. We just got to go look for it and deal with it when it comes. Jared, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you had some transitional lighting conditions on, on that shoot and, and uh, potentially initially some PID because you had a scout light or is that a different shoot I'm thinking about? Different. So I, okay. I think. Which, so I, th I, I thought Timmy had said that you had the original like 120 lumen whatever scout and it just you felt 
that it didn't have enough throw initially to see see dude out there, but um, he might have been talking about that. That was on my first shooting. That was on my first shooting. It was uh, a a different dude, and and I could see what was happening, but when I started moving in between these houses, like he started shooting at me, and I was was pushing my light out, but it wasn't pushing the light. Like, you know what I mean? That's – people get wrapped up with all, like, the uh, the lumens and this and that. I'm like, hey, bro, how well does that light – how well does it push light? And like, they don't get that. They just think, well, no, it's lumens. It's got a lot of shit on here. I saw it on Amazon. I'm like, no, bitch, how far does it push it? So beam characteristics, central throw and, and, and how far away that works. Yeah. All that. It's, it's, it's frustrating that we've gone to entirely a lumens uh, mentality with the led world. Um, as much as we have, I think, because beam characteristics are as or more important with what your central throw looks like, what the corona looks like, how distinct it is, and what your spill looks like, and all those characteristics feed into what makes a good light. This is, it goes back to some of the things we've talked about here with you know, 500 lumen lights being too much, but that's not the case because the beam characteristics just have much more useful spill as well as a very strong central throw. Right. I mean, I don't, I've never been anywhere where I said, hey, this is too much light. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Well, what drives me nuts, too, is the guys that are putting fucking pistol lights on rifles. Ugh. Fucking. Yeah. It's going to be the death of Fisher. It's, it's worse for Fisher than me, but guys that are putting TLR1. We, we, we just recovered one from night fighter class, uh, you know, into the course, uh, doing the final wrap up and, uh, all right. Hey, who's X 300 with Picatinny plastic spacer is this? And it was one of the SWAT cops. And he was like, dude, I'm so glad you found that. That's going to save me from having to write up or whatever, you know? And, uh, it's like, yeah, man, p- pistol lights on a, on a rifle. Um, yeah, that, that's what you're going to get. You, you know, the other part of that, that a lot of dudes overlook too, is, you know, Capturing on what Dwayne was saying, you, you know, you can have all this ultimate spill and throw and all the great beam stuff. The problem that a lot of guys miss is the environmental conditions and how it sucks up the light. You know, you may start with a 500 lumen light and depending on your batteries, your lens, all that other good stuff. And then, you know, the dust, the snow, the rain, the pollen, all that stuff, man, that gets eaten up fast. That's why I'm a big proponent of the max I can get on a gun as far as light goes just to help with all of those things in consideration. Yeah. The other side of that is heat, uh, sucks up, uh, your throat, your power. Yeah. Uh, and the measurement for lumens for a light is based on the standards of one minute after one minute. What is the, what is the maximum output of the light? And they measure it in a little sphere to get the total light output. But, uh, a lot, a lot of lights, uh, and that's what differentiates a great light from a, an okay light is the fact that after five minutes of being on and being used, you still have great beam par- characteristics and great output, and you're not the heat hasn't destroyed your beam characteristics. Now you basically run an essentially a 200 lumen light at something that was advertised at 750 or some crap. So what I see with like the pistol lights on uh, rifles is a lot of um, dudes, like they'll use it CQB style or whatever. So like my measurement is not like how many lumens it is. I take it outside and I got to shine it from my backyard through my backyard to my neighbor's house and be able to see something there. That's like my thing is, is, is a distance thing. It's not that. And I think also we as instructors, you know, a lot of times a lot of instructors aren't doing the job anymore. So they'll just throw, cause, and, and they train during the day, they do a lot of things, so they'll throw a pistol light on there because it keeps their gun light, it keeps this. But dudes see that, and they're like, hey, man, like that's that's the new shit or whatever it is. And he's going to say it's the shit because it is, it, I mean, it works for his course. Or, you know what I mean? It is, what, it is, but it's not what he used when he fought. So it's kind of like, hey, you can't – throw people down that thing if you didn't use it when you fought kind of deal. Right. It, it's 12 o'clock and it's all sexy when you can do ambi on, on barricades, uh, you know, cause you have it at 12 o'clock. However, comma, how many, how many times have you slung that thing with full kit and had a white light AD at night at the rear of the bearcat or whatever? Cause you've got that push button thingy on the back of the X 300. So mm-hmm. 
Yeah. That's a good point because there's – I'm not going to name him, but there's a very, very well-known national instructor that was running a TLR1 on, on a quad rail, mm. and that was making it hard for some dudes because they're like, well, he does it, so, like, it's got to be legit. And so it was, like, not just trying to unfuck it, but it was trying to overcome that curve, too, of, like, well, if he does it, it's got to be good for me. Yeah. So, I mean, I think people forget how – easily students idolize instructors and one little dumb thing that you do not thinking about it people hang on to it and they get attached to it oh that it becomes gospel that's like one thing like i learned as an instructor early on like doing stuff like you know my my uh my mentor and like the, my guy with the, with the wrestling group my kai has always said hey bro every word you say weighs so much more on people and he's like you have to like think about every and like i'm like what do you mean i'm just talking and he's like, no, bro, you got to stop. And look, like every word you say means something. So you, you got to slow it down. And that was mean things. Yes. And that was a great advice. Like, it was just like, all right, you know, everything you do on the range, every time you show something, it, it better be right because they're going to see it and it's out there. When you're an instructor, you're just not relaying curriculum. You're actually setting an example. Right. It's like, just like Fisher, he has to own a miss when he does a, a lot of fire demo, just like he was talking about the other night. I have to own my hits. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, if I show up looking like a bag of assholes, which is arguable, I probably do um, five times out of ten. Um, but still, I, I owe it to the student because they've paid the money to be there to come and see how it's done right, just like – just like uh, Roland preaches, you know, you go to that course to know what right looks like. And it goes down to kit selection and kit setup. And it drives me nuts whenever I see um, other instructors, not saying my coworkers necessarily, uh, but I've seen coworkers from maybe previous jobs or whatnot that will do ass nine things. And I'm just like, dude, yeah, you might have rolled, rolled that way in Fallujah, but dude, that was like, 10 years ago, bro, like there's better methods now. We don't need to be using 550 cord to set up slings anymore. Yeah, it worked great back then, but now we need to be setting a higher, a higher standard because that's what they're going to replicate. Um, Who's going to happen to see cell magnite? Light isn't legit anymore. No, yeah, it doubles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you got an MP5. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. trailer platoon tactics right there, man. I wonder if Phil Chaney the... still teaches that. Yeah, he might. What, what was <laughs> over in '88? What, what was the old like the old Rayovac that you could plug in and recharge the rubber coated Rayovac, dude? Just a fucking dump pouch full of D cells running around the range. <laughs> <laughs> and just remember, you can throw them at people when when everything else stops working and you're out of ammo. <laughs> yeah, melee weapon, dude. I'm all about that. That's on the bucket list. Oh God! <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Editing pause. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Though, uh, Dwayne, there was a request for you to only answer in your Spanish accent. Mm. <laughs> I still have dreams about that. Uh, that's disturbing. <laughs> it was a good time, though, I will admit. Oh, that was awesome. We did that as a scratch take. We were going to have Jimmy do it. Because <laughs> he's, yeah, no shit. Lebardo Jimenez, it uh, would have uh, been much more legitimate, but it was just so doggone corny that we kept the scratch track. So Jimmy could have never nailed it like that, though. There's no way. <laughs> and I just realized I neglected to use this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's got to be cooler pictures on the internet than, than that one. That's just That was just found on the internet. Hey, uh, Jared, I've actually got a question from a friend of mine. Okay. Uh, he asked, uh, where's the, the best written story of what happened, uh, the, the story you, you know, verbally recounted about that particular shooting? Um, 
kind of like uh, kind of like what you got here, but actually written down. Uh, he's a, a squad leader, platoon sergeant now uh, in in Colorado, and he wants to use it as kind of a case study, as an example to his guys um, to look at for uh, you know the for obvious reasons. Yes. Um, shit. Masada Yub wrote a pretty good article on it. Um, it's been published. Matt something shit. He wrote a pretty good article. There's been several. You just Google it. Like Google my name, I guess, and then let him pick from which one. I mean, none of them are really going to change much differently, except for their like their little inputs. Um. Shit. Give me a second. I'll come back to you. I'm going to start Googling on my phone while we're doing this, and I'll, I'll let you know. Bill wants to know if you use a beard oil. Me? Yeah. Of course I use beard oil. I got a damn beard. I'm a damn man, right? Got to take care of your shit. Look, easiest way to do it anymore, straight almond oil. Works perfect. Big bottles. Cheap. But then smell delicious. No, it smells, like, it smells like almonds a little bit. Little hint, it's not bad. Beats patchouli. It goes well with his uh, Nutella and his mustache. So. Hey, hey, don't be knocking on the Nutella. <laughs> Grease from your last in and out burger doesn't count as beard oil. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so, Jared, considering what you went through, how do you feel about support side shooting with a rifle? Portside shooting is, is a must with a rifle. Um, not only for injury, without getting too much into the weeds on this, you got to be able to shoot. So inside a house and things like that, where I'm asking you to, hey, I need you to shoot 10 yards. So you need to be able to transition your other shoulder, pie off doors, because your exposure is so much less, you know, going – opposite shoulder and shooting like seven yards. I'm not asking you to shoot, you know, 200 yards standing or something like that. It's seven yards off shoulder with a rifle. Give me a damn break with a red dot. I mean, throw it up there, bang away. So we're, we're huge proponents on going off shoulder. Speaking of which I just, well, it was a few hours ago, Steve, I posted your video of you shooting both shoulders with your nice new rifle. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm a big proponent of it. Uh, Jared saying, you know, guys have got to be fluid enough to be able to switch on the spot. They've got to be very fluid in operating the controls on the gun, working the gun, you know, just finding that consistent weld. And if they're not practicing it, or that it's not being driven home in their training, training, it's definitely wrong. I'm a big proponent of it. I practice it a lot. I teach it a lot. It's got to be done. It's just like a handgun. You got to be good with either hand. You should be the same with a long gun. And also the fact that you were doing that with a magnified optic was cool as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you guys, guys will knock magnified, but it, it, it's, it, it's literally the next upcoming step again, back in like patrol guns, law enforcement, I'm seeing more of them. Uh, or like we've talked about before, you know, the eyes change, the positive threat identification, the, you know, the transitional zones of distance shooting, you know, big box stores, active shooter stuff, schools, you know, we, we took lessons from this, you know, going back to Somalia, you know, when dudes were intermixing in the crowds with others and they're all dressed alike. I mean, you know, like we said before, you know, some, some kid in high school, he's blending in with all his buddies and the description are, isn't always correct. And even with artificial lighting, white lights and the carbines, I'm finding that magnified optics really do make a difference versus a red dot. Gives you a bigger people. Mm-hmm. I just uh, edited that section last night too, and that that was a great section. I'm I'm looking forward to having that finally published. Yeah, I think a lot of guys get into a false sense of security with red dots and the fact that you can do stupid human tricks and, and hit stuff at ridiculous distances with with just a red dot. But it's that that PID mm -hmm. and no fitting discrimination that's the factor. Yeah, and, and like we had talked about in that segment, you know, they're not always the bad guy. It may not always be actively engaging you. You know, doing it on a square range of the red dots, cool, everybody can do it. But, again, the PID, obviously, and, you know, are they actually shooting at you at this point? Can you pick them out? Are they just mingling around? How do we know it's them? You know, 
it's there's a lot of factors that go into it. The more and more diving deeper and going back into magnified optics on guns. A lot of those guys that are proponents of using their of iron sights or even just using red dots if uh, if they were to actually hunt. But th there are quite a few of them that do hunt. And if you look at their hunting rifle, they're running magnified optics. Yeah. And there's a disconnect there. A little one. You know, even on, my, even on most of my hunting guns, uh, you know, in Michigan, I've got shots outwards of 400 yards across some of the fields here. I still run a one to four, one to six on a vast majority of my hunting guns. I don't need much more than that to pick a deer out and to be able to shoot the deer. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do it with a red dot, but hey, it's much better having that that magnification and the light transmission as the light starts to change, lets you get those shadows a lot better. Hey, uh, Jared, on your uh, taser. Do you have a cartridge failure or a catastrophic malfunction of the actual device? Do you guys go back and look at it afterwards? Yes. So they went back and looked at it. They don't, they could not, it was not a cartridge malfunction. It never sent a charge through. Taser's now updated something to kind of alleviate that side of it. I don't, they don't really know what happened to it. They knew that I, they had the record of me, they had the record of me um, testing it at the beginning of my shift. They had the record of it going, like counting and doing everything, but it just didn't fire. And the, so, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And I think that's an important note too, because I think we're something we're seeing with the younger generation of law enforcement is an over-dependence on less lethal and specifically taser. And if it doesn't go pop when they want it to, kind of at a loss. And so I think it's an important lesson that you got to be able to seamlessly transition from I taser failed to go on hands on. All that is a huge, huge training issue because too many police officers get stuck in plan A. And if, you know, any guys on here to law enforcement or whatever, like you've seen videos or whatever it is, even with pepper spray, some somebody knows somebody who could eat some pepper spray and it doesn't bother them. Right? You watch videos or you've been around a police officer who get who pepper sprays somebody and it doesn't affect them. What's the first thing they do? They spray more pepper spray on that asshole. You know what I mean? Hey, that doesn't, that's not how that works. You know, it's not, more is not going to make it worse. You know, you got to change your thing, but they're stuck in plan A. So your taser doesn't work. I, to me, a taser is a good plan C. Like, you know what I mean? I don't care. Like, I'm not going to trust my life to an Xbox controller. That's just, it's plastic. It's, you know, the elements are down here in Florida, the humidity, it's just, you know, it's great, but it, it is what it is. And I'm not going to depend my life on, on something like that. So with that, you got to be able to go, hey, I pepper sprayed you. It's nothing cool. I'm ditching that can and I'm going to go hands on or I'm going to go baton or I'm going to do whatever it is. But too many people keep spraying and they want to do the less lethal. And too many departments are getting away from combatives and going to all less lethal training because – liability it doesn't get anybody hurt typically you know what i mean and so it's less money for them because dt gets people hurt you know that they're going to get iod's and all that but that's you can't get away from it i don't give a shit what you think this job's about law enforcement our primary goal is to put bad people in jail that is it it got passed off that we you know we want to be the counselors we want to do this we want to do that we want to do this Hey, that's fine. We, we can hire people to do that. But our primary goal is to keep bad people in jail and to keep them away from the good people. That's it. It's, that's been like that over time. You can't change that. You can't change any of the shit that you want to do, the community policing and all that bullshit. You can't change the fact that bad people are out there. And good people have to stand in the way and put them in jail. That's it. Amen. Yep, I agree. Okay, question for the group. Outside of already having a stockpile or issued, why would one go with a 45 or 40 over a modern 9? 
And the reason I ask this is I have a coworker that's still stuck on 40 and doesn't believe the, the fact that no, modern nine is. Well, first off, the, four, the 40 is a horrible round. It's a bastard round. There's no gun made for a 40 caliber. You know, the, the recoil is horrendous on it and the guns aren't built for it. So guns don't work for it because they build them for a nine mill them out for a 40 and so it's a it's a bastardized gun. No bastardized round that you ever know like works really well. So just don't do it. And if you got a stockpile of it, trade that shit for nine millimeters. Somebody wants forty. And it's something I'm dealing with too. Uh, going through the nine mil transition is uh, a lot of people are bucking back, and a lot of it's just misinformation. They don't realize um, when you look at ballistic testing, barrier performance, the whole big picture that nine mil hangs with 40 all day, every day. And it's just, you know, the old school mentality that bigger is better, not realizing that in 2016, that it's not the size as so much as it's the technology and the engineering thought behind it. And so I've actually been able to sway quite a few minds um, by showing it, not talking it because um, people get emotionally attached to rounds. It, it's like, it's fucking weird, but like people spent you're 45. I hate to say it burning the asses, but they're the worst with the emotional attachment to the round. Like you just told them that their fucking kid sucks at life and like they're, they're no longer worthy and they get fucking offended by it. But uh, if you go on show, like when I did the range demonstration, uh, for my captain, uh, fucking sold on the spot for nine mil. So. Well, that's the uh, that's the shooting industry, and by extension, you know everybody involved as a whole. Um, they, uh, they they the emotional attachment to anything seems to be a driving force, and that's kind of why PNS was created in the in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hard part of that argument was there was a time. Uh, in a not too distant distant past, where you know, it, it was relevant, but it's completely overcome by events as far as projectile performance now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, technology is caught up. <laughs> and I can yeah, definitely I see I can definitely yeah. see in Steve's case with being with 1911s that makes sense. You have you have that already. I I have a big selection. I mean, my 1911s are split between nine and 45. And 10 millimeter, actually, I've got a couple of Delta Elites in there too. But, you know, honestly, you know, I carry a 45 just because, well, why not? You know, I, I get, you know, hey, I've got them, I'll carry them. It, it doesn't mean it's ineffective, especially with, you know, the modern rounds for the 45. But again, why when I can carry a Glock 19, a 17, you know, a 27 shot, you know, double stack 9 mil 1911 get the best of both worlds at that point. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of options out there, but there is no reason for any agency to be carrying anything other than a 9 millimeter right now. Zero. Absolutely zero. Their, their, score, their scores will increase, the quals, everything, the overall performance will just be, we've proven it, we've done it, we've sat in the departments and we've done it. You know, they just, a lot of it is still the old school, you know, who's sitting in the seat that still likes it. I've got one of the agencies by me locally that I've done a lot of work with and, you know, they're still stuck on 45. Hey, that's great. Awesome. No problem. It works. You know, they carry good ammo in it. Great. Pretty proactive on their training. The problem is the chief is the guy who's like, it's got to be a 45. You know, he's the old school 80 street cop guy who, you know, when nine mil was getting all the bad rap, the FBI shootout, all those things, and it's got to be 45. And unfortunately, the department is just stuck with what the boss says. He won't hear anything differently. And they just recently, thankfully, made the transition at least to a double stack. They went to M&Ps in 45 from SIG double action only, you know, 220s. So at least they're getting a little bit better about it. But... You, you can only fight that battle so much with administration. At what point, though, really, I mean, we can pile up data now for years proving, you know, statistically and using a shitload of science, we can prove what's better and we can show the numbers game, you know, 
cents per trigger press, how many more trigger presses do we get in training with one versus the other? At what point does it just not become just straight up malfeasance on the administration's part? Is that going to take like the unions? Is that going to, I mean, what's it going to take? Or is it just going to be natural selection? Those dudes just dying off and retire. I mean, I'm down with waiting them out too, but just throwing that out there. I mean, is there something to be said for that? Not to be a squeaky wheel, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's, there, there's an argument for repetitive use injuries also. And I, sh I used to shoot a ton of 45 and damn, I was always fighting all kind of tendonitis and craziness. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, brother. All day. Yep. You know, that was mitts, and that's with mitts like yours. I know. And, you, know, you know, that was something I had talked to Hilton Yam about back in like 2010 when I, when I was in Florida with Hilton and we were talking about it and he was already making that transition away pretty heavily. It was like, I just can't take the con the consistent pounding over a two, three day, four day, five day class of running 45. You know, you know me, I'm a 1911 guy. It's just, I said, Do you're, you're barking up the tree, dude. I, I know this. You, you know, my elbows are beat up. Your wrists are beat up. Yeah. Do you think it's a uh, similar to uh, you know a guy have a three hundred eight because five five six isn't enough? Do you think it's also a, a somebody carrying a bigger round because they you know it's the, that whole you only have to shoot them once argument, and that's it's kind of like stacking a bunch of fucking tactical shit on your gun to compensate for maybe even a, a, a known or subconscious fear that you don't have enough training or competency. Like it, the bigger round is going to be a safety blanket. Yeah. Same dudes drive two wheel drive trucks with 33 inch tires on. Yeah. I, I don't think it's as big in the local community. I mean, there's still always those guys, you, you know, that are, you know, 30 cal, 30 cal, 30 cal. I get that. But in the handgun world, it's, it's definitely, you know, 500 times over that. The 308 556 deal, you, you don't hear as much about it anymore. I think where guys originally, you know, that was like that 1970s era, late 60s, you, you know, with again, it's kind of like the 9 verse 45. You get the bad rap from the ammunition. You know, what guys are used to from previous performances based on, you know, carrying M14s, going into the 556 guns, performance of the ammunition. And then it just keeps building over the years, and you know it's it's pretty much. I, I can see where you're at with that, but I don't think so. I think it's it's really heavy in the handgun world more than anything else. Yeah, and another factor with that between the, the 308 and the and the 223 or whatnot is that it's really hard to find uh, a, a a sample of each caliber rifle and have quality. Like it's it's for the longest time it's been so hard to get a. a the 762 gas gun to run with the same reliability that you can get a 556 gun in. And so that's been limiting that whole argument because you had to, you're, you're looking at, you're in the $3,000 game at that point, just to be able to carry 10 rounds less per magazine. Um, and so that, that, that's more of a factor in nullifying that argument. Unless you've got a roller locker and, you know, Dwayne's favorite. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess I kind of uh, it was a bad example. I was just trying to draw that that parallel between uh, you know, like the the emotional attachment with the fear of you know not having enough round to do the job, when the reality is is all pistol bullets pretty much suck. Some marginally more than others. Hey Meckley, you didn't work out today, did you? I can't tell. Oh, I did. I know. <laughs> I think uh, with pistols, most of it is, is like gun store gurus who sell a dude something, and then once you buy it, you ain't gonna say your shit sucks. Once you once you commit to buying it, you're not gonna say your shit sucks. I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. And and I'm kind of the same way. Like I don't sell guns. Like if I bought it, like it's still in my room. Like I still have it. And like, you know, you're never going to say, well, well, you know, this is what it is. And you're going to do the, all the internet research. You're going to do all this shit and you're never going to really listen. And then what you're going to do is you're going to buy another gun at some point and be like, yeah, yeah, that was right. But you're not going to do it until you buy another gun until they experience it. They're not going to buy. 
They're not going to buy off on the 45 or nine or whatever it is until you actually go out and buy it. No one wants or, to be told or, they have or an or ugly take baby. The 45 out and go train. That's typically it. Like I run a concealed carry course and it's not like to get your permit. It's to, you know, how to fight from concealment and jokers. I, that is like the, probably the best course that jokers are like, I'm getting rid of this. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Like I'll use my dad as an example. He carried a Kimber 45. You know what I mean? He loved it. And you know, that's, that was his shit. You know what I mean? And my dad taught me how to shoot. He was, he shot competition when like we were kind of growing up and, uh, I got out, I was like, hey, man, you need a Glock 19. Like, I don't know what the hell you're doing with this bullshit. And he's like, this is the shit. You know, I paid $2,300 for this. And I'm like, all right, well, it's bullshit. And and then he took a course and worked on it. He's like, yep. And he came back and took the course the next time I offered it, and he had a Glock 19 because that's just how it's going to be. If you ever do serious stuff, you're going to change. That's that's the bottom line. It's, it's up to hits on – accurate hits on paper – in a certain amount of time, you're going to change. And if you don't believe it, then you're then just carry your 45 or carry your judge or whatever the hell you want to carry and just be happy. And the, those 1911 guys in classes, I think a big factor of that is, yeah, it beats up their hands, but really what, what tears them up and gives them a case of the red ass is how often they're having to chase or, around empty magazines and start jamming mags in between lulls and the drills and stuff. Because – most of them, unlike Steve here, like most of them, they might show up with three seven-round magazines to a course. Rarely do you have one show up with a ten-round magazine, you know. But they're always over there having to jam mags. They don't get a moment's respite in the course because they are constantly thumbing more rounds into that little tiny magazine. Mm-hmm. And you know what else gets them? Is that a fucking Glock's out shooting them because they want to buy performance instead of working on doing stuff. When you could have bought a Glock, and I'm shooting Glocks, you know on 25 yard bulls, like a ball, you're all over the freaking place with your 45. Like very few dudes can really drive a gun and do things. So at least get the ammo in there so you can get your, so your 20% has more hitting factors in there. <laughs> I'm still not trading in my 1911s. <laughs> not trading them in. I wouldn't yeah, trade it. You just got to buy a Glock. <laughs> I so, got like 30 of them. I don't need any more. Um, one of the things that I do to drive home um, this argument is uh, I, I don't alibi uh, courses of fire for dudes that have guns with shitty magazine capacity. If we're going to do, like I do, I do a wide transition steel target, like make the guy get out of his front sight and drive the gun all the way across to the other side of the berm. And I, they basically bounce back and forth between MVMs, uh, ACs on steel, like a pinball machine. And to, to be able to grade everybody on par, I'd say, Hey, if you have a high and above average capacity gun, like 17, 18, 21, 22, uh, put in a 15 round mag. Cause that's your standard, your Glock 19, your service pistol Beretta, whatever. And then the Glock 21 guys are like, Oh, we only have, uh, you know, 13 plus one or 12 plus one or whatever. I was like, all right, well, you got a program mag change in there. So you, you better be, you know, two seconds faster than your peers. If you expect to be competitive in this, in this drill, but that that's the reality, you know? That, that is the absolute reality um, is you got, you got the gun, you brung. I, I've never had anybody ask me if, uh, if I was running open class or limited or limited 10 in a gunfight. It's never come up. Yep. I, uh, you know, when I pushed that really hard, when I was, when I'm like, was really seriously super running 1911s a lot, which I still do, but I, I spent an entire training season of classes running nothing but single stack guns. And I'm like, if I can reload a single stack gun, I can reload a double stack even easier. You know, and, you know, Jeff Gonzalez joked on me about that. He's like, you know, you wouldn't be the first person I've ever failed in a class with a single stack gun. Well, he didn't fail me. You know, Dave Harrington, you know, both high round count classes, a lot of heavy drills on accuracy and stuff. And I literally was probably five to one to every high cap driver there. And I had to be, but you know, that was, that was my choice, my challenge. And I said, you know, I'm going to do it. And I did, but most dudes will not dedicate the time to do it, especially with a single stack gun. They, they won't. That was my issued piece for, you know, the few years I spent there running around and, uh, 
I was never so happy as to the day that I could put that away and go back to plastic fantastic. <laughs> okay, then, with that in mind, what is your guilty pleasure gun that you own that has no practical purpose and you probably shouldn't even own? Mine, This is, and I'm going to say this for Steve, Benelli M1 Super 90. Shotguns, yes. Yes, I have no no reason to even own it. Yes, you do. Shotguns are great. <sighs> mm, mine, mine is a Sig P210. I love that gun. It, I want one. It, it's amazing, and I, and I bought it because I wanted it, and I always wanted it, and I got it, and I shoot it a little bit, and I just. Ah, and I put it away. It just serves no purpose other than to pull out every now and then, go ooh and ah. And I think the only gun that I ever got rid of that was kind of like that, another one, was an HK VP70. Hmm. I had to have the Buck Rogers gun. I had to have it. It was awesome. Besides all my roller lockers, uh, uh, I would probably say that uh, an 1874 Sharps reproduction. Nice. That, uh, I shoot uh, black powder cartridge with paper patch bullets that I cast myself, and that's absolutely zero practicality whatsoever. But if don't you ever would... say that again. That is 100% <laughs> common sense firearms ownership right there. All right, all right. As long as somebody else is on track with me. <laughs> okay, just please tell us it's like a 5110 or something, though. It's really... <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's actually just a 4570 just for brass availability. When you paper patch it, you can push them way out and put 82 or 84 grains of powder in That's just a cool gun. That's awesome. You know, Chris, uh, worked, Chris worked there for a summer building those guns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've got two that are tied. Uh, they're both subcompact 1911 frames. One is a STI Escort in 9 mil that holds 7 plus 1 and won't go through a magazine without having a malfunction because um, it came from STI. Yeah. Um, and, you know, S a STIs work when they're built by other people other than STI. Um, and then the other one though, it, it, the other one has cool guy factor, but is even less practical. It is a Colt 1991, um, subcompact 1911. That was, uh, Mike Allen's personal carry gun for about two years. And he needed some cash for a project or whatever. And he let it go to me for about 11 or $1,200. And he had totally tricked it out. If you guys don't know Mike Allen, he's the owner of Mike Allen customs. Um, MHA Custom Shop. He's the guy that built uh, Max 1911 that you always see him running in all of his uh, mm -hmm. his cool Mac videos or whatever. So, you know, M Mike is a legendary uh, 1911 guru. So the fact that, uh, that I got his carry gun, I even got his leather uh, Kramer IWB holster with it. I was like, throw the holster in too. Um, but again, six rounds of fucking 45 ACP in a, in a tremendously large recoil package and short sight radius uh, that has no particularly good finish that would rust if I wore it on a summer day and didn't re-oil it. Like, why? Like, why the fuck would I ever carry that gun? Um it's a fucking showpiece. Hey, this is a this is a you know, legendary gunsmith's personal carry piece. It's a that's all it's good for. I mean, if I got into a gunfight with that thing and lived, I would like come on the internet and shame myself. <laughs> <laughs> Fact. That's awesome. I think my, I think my one gun. Um, my most ridiculous gun, it's the 1911 I built in school. It was built off a, uh, a Springer GI. Um, I, we had to do everything to it. Um, ended up chopping an inch off the slide at the bushing end muzzle, and I built a full profile compensator for it, a quarter inch longer, and I milled spikes in the front of it, and then uh, color case hardened it, 
just the compensator. And then I Cerakoted a green snake scale. Um, pretty ridiculous. It's the only way I can get it to cycle because the throw on it is so shortened up is I had to chop a two, two, eight spring and stuff it in there. Um, yeah, it shoots like a dream though when it goes bang, but yeah, it just sits in a drawer now. But that's probably my most ridiculous gun. No one else? I got one of those Keltec folders. For some reason, I had to have it. And I got it in 40 just because I shoot 40 with the department. And, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it may have its use at some point, but it just sits in the closet. But, you know, whatever. It folds, <laughs> well, already... up. It, it folds up small, so it's sweet. <laughs> and you already have the mags for it. Yeah, and I got mags for it, so why the fuck not? And Jim, I think your audio might be working now. And no, it's not. Maybe not. No. <laughs> I thought I unplugged it. Oh, you did. <laughs> oh wait. Oh, there's. Did something. I unplug it accidentally somehow? Yeah. Amazing. You sound like you're in a toilet though. And look you're, like a Nintendo. You're you're a step higher than Bill was. Mm. All right. We'll see if we can unplug it further then. And it looks like Kung Fu Theater because the words don't match the video. <laughs> <laughs> we trained him wrong on purpose as a joke. Uh, I think the most like impractical thing that I have, right, I have like two like totally impractical guns right now still. One is getting done by uh, Dakota Tactical. I'm actually getting uh, one of my 91s chopped down to a G3K conversion. I have no idea what I'm going to do with a 12-inch collapsible stock 308. No. Wash, wash your mouth out with soap. Okay, I'm going to do a lot of cool stuff with it because, <laughs> it does, because it's do awesome. whatever you want with that, man. Yeah. That's awesome. G G3K is that's probably my favorite iteration of that platform. Yeah, I I, I dropped I dropped the 91 off to uh, Joe over there and I'm like, here, do something with this. And next thing you know, he's like, hey, bro, you're not going to believe what I'm doing with this gun. I'm like, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't even care at this point, you know. I'm like, he's like, no, I'm gonna do this. I'm like, I just wanted a Picatinny rail across the top of the gun. He's like, it doesn't matter. You're getting this. I'm like, okay. And I got one of those goofy Keltec CMR30 uh, little collapsible stock twin two mag carbines. It's like a poor man's MP7. The squirrels are gonna pay, and so are the woodchucks this year. <laughs> well, you've seen my uh, railed front and rear uh, D54, right? With the, yes. Uh, the M lock or the uh, M bus pros on it and the uh, front and rear. That the whole that that was one of those just because you can kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. I saw that. I was like, that is awesome. Yeah, that that, that 3K is going to be a fun gun. I just have no clue what I'm going to do with it, but I'll do something. Well, the great thing is shooting 150s at, you know, 2,400 feet a second. It can control the recoil a lot better. <laughs> I have AMAX on hand. <laughs> oh, I love that thing. Oh, the T3K is pretty fun. Oh, I can't wait. For it. I'm actually kind of excited about it. I can't wait to get it back. I think it's going to be great. I'm just going, I don't even know why, but who cares? Don't, just don't shoot it inside. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, I see a suppressor in its near future. <laughs> well, get yourself a number 17 locking piece for an HK21 if you're going to do that, and then it should shoot fine, suppressed and unsuppressed. I may hit you up on the uh, notes on that later if I decide to go that route. I, I just want to get to the range that like, had the biggest fireballs ever coming out of that gun. It's it's if you got a decent flash hider, it's not ridiculous with you know twelve point seven inch barrel. Get yourself one turn in there, but uh, it's not as it's not as bad as you would think. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, toys. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Can I have one for you? And I think this one will probably need to start with Roland. 
We haven't had this discussion here yet. Uh-oh. We've, ha- we've had it on, I don't think we had it on the forum yet. We have had it on Facebook. The practicality of adjustable pistol sights on a combat gun. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, adjustable sights have reached the level of durability that I absolutely, um, you know, trust them with my life. Uh, I, I've shot people with pistols that had adjustable sights on it. As a matter of fact, I think every person that I've ever shot with a handgun had adjustable sights on it, um, unless there's an RDS in there somewhere that I'm I'm not uh, remembering. Um, so. Yeah, uh, the the bottom line is is when you learn how to shoot a pistol, and I mean like you really learn how to shoot a pistol, you will eventually be able to outshoot your handgun. And when you start stacking shots in sub three inch groups of twenty five yards, and that sub three inch group is hanging out around the nine ten ring split, but if you would take it and superimpose it over the the center of the ten ring, you'd have like a a one hundred six or seven x that like that'll make you want to beat children. So the only way to remedy that situation is adjustable sights. Um, you can, you can push with a sight tool a little bit left or right. But when you start getting into elevation issues, you're either paying hundreds of dollars to, to switch out sights uh, and you're swagging. You're, you're like, okay, well I'll go with this site and it does whatever, or I'll go with this site and it does whatever. And by the time, uh, if you're not adjust, if you're not adding your own sights onto the gun, if you're having to do gunsmithing or whatever, in the amount of time that it took you to experiment with what height front sight is going to get you where you need to be elevation wise, you could have just invested in the, fucking adjustables in the first place and been done with it. You can get adjustables with tritium. You can get adjustables with fibers. You can get adjustable fiber and tritium. Um, there, there's just no reason from a practical standpoint um, that, that you don't need an adjustable uh, sight on your handgun once, once you are carrying a service weapon that's capable of sub three inch groups and you are capable of sub three inch groups of 25 yards. You know, so once your pistol game elevates to that, uh, you, you got to do something to get back on target. That's all I got. No, I'd be, uh, I'm a hundred percent with that. The, uh, there's, there's, there's things you can do, especially if you don't use uh tritium on the rear, if you have tritium or a fiber on the front and you play the game, pushing it back and forth with a good pushing tool. If you're trying to do it with a drift, you might as well forget it. And you can mill down, you do the, you know, the whole site calculator, site radius versus distance and move the group and take some off the top of the rear site and all that stuff. But then you're good for one load. And if you, you switch your, your carry ammo or whatever, then you're right back to square one and you're completely screwed again. So now it's uh, it's 100% on board with that being frustrated and the advancements in adjustables that, uh, that put you where you need to be without worrying about the thing failing on you. It's not like you're not inletting a, a K-frame site into a 1911 slide at this point. 1970s called it like their shit back. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I've carried adjustables on duty for six years now. Like duty beating the shit out of them, always doing and count my life on them. And like I've never lost a zero with them. Like I don't know that it's not like this is a, it's a, I don't get it. Like it, it's it's to me why not. You know, everyone gets a gun from the factory with a rifle and they'll adjust the sights. But you get a gun from the factory, a pistol from the factory, no one wants to touch their fucking sights. I mean, you got to tap sight. You got to do stuff. It's just, it's amazing to me on how accuracy ignorant people are. And I'm just like, hey, man, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Is it, well, that might be me. I was like, well, cool. Well, if the gunfight happens today, you might want to bump your sights over, and then if you start shooting that way, then you can change. But other than that, you better get your mind right for right now. Back, back to Roland's uh, point, I think the, the the largest portion of the consumer base out there doesn't shoot very far with a handgun, so they don't see the, the relevance. And, you know, if you're shooting a, a pie plate group at 15 yards, then you may not see the value there, and that's – as common as anything else, some you know, out there. Day one of the class, walking back at twenty five yards, see what we got for an inventory and one hundred percent. 
what are you guys running for adjustables for a red dot setup? Is as far as the red dot itself or for the backups? For your irons. You're at your you're at some limits right now with that because of the spacing on the guns. Uh, you're pretty much restricted to a drift adjustable that's reliable. I know we, we've talked about this kind of briefly before, but the loophole uh, has a rear adjustable, but it's horrible. I've you know some of us here have seen them come off guns and heard the stories of it. I'm right now you're just you're limited to a fixed up until. I'm going to say sometime probably hovering around NRA show, possibly going into shot. You will see some stuff coming out that may, hopefully it's working. If not, we're just going to be stuck with adjust with a uh, adjust rears. And the patch, the packaging will have your picture on it too. No. It's not that big. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not on those. Um, but yeah, right now you're totally restricted. Yep, and none of my irons shoot where my gun points, and I just know that. But, I mean, you know, you've got um, – the reality is, and, and everybody gets bent out of shape on red dots because they've all had one fail or they've all seen one fail. But if it takes you 5,000 rounds to break an RMR, and when I say break it, meaning that it has some type of electronic failure where you lose it for 30 days while it goes off for warranty, and then you get it back and it's good for another 5,000 rounds, you are literally taking, you're rolling the dice that the, you know, 30 rounds of gunfight that you're going to get into is going to be within the band of the 30 rounds that, that that RMR decides to stop working. And the chances of you getting into a lethal force encounter at the exact time that your RMR after a 4,799 round round count has decided that it wants to shit the bed. And in that day, if that happens, you, you probably should have uh, practiced a little Kentucky windage hold off for your iron sights. Um, cause, cause you got, you know, you've got a dark cloud hanging over you in that gunfight at that point. Um, you know, so you're just going to have to fight through it, but, but I'm going to roll them dice. Because the other four thousand, you know, seven hundred and ninety-nine shots that I take with that gun are going to be fucking amazing. Because that red dot's going to work. Yeah, and that's one of the situations where I'll do the Ameriglo suppressor slice or whatever that they're just straight irons, and I'll mill off or file off what I need to to get pretty darn close to, you know, point A and point impact. Yeah, it, it, it's it's one thing we talked about the other night, Dwayne. We we haven't seen is that shooting the irons through the red dot is definitely been an issue. Um, you know, did some test bed with it, pulled, pulled the red dot off, put it back on. You could definitely see a, de a definitive shift in point of aim, point of impact, just by looking through those two lenses on that red dot, trying to get those sights going. There's definitely parallax with it. Concur. On the irons. Yeah. And as far as adjustables on pistols are concerned, what are you guys doing for your sighting in? It's awesome. I mean, what process? <laughs> so you send it to Dawson and he plays it in for you? <laughs> Everyone. No, 25 yards. 25. <laughs> 25. Yeah, I'll, I'll zero to 25 as well. Same with irons, and I shoot everything at 100 just to see where what I got with that particular ammunition and that particular sight set up, just so I know. Yeah, I haven't seen many walkbacks go beyond 100, so uh, so I'll, I'll get it back there as well just to get the, the hold-offs down right because um, yeah, on the walkback is not the day you want to be figuring out how, how far high you need to be holding for that load at that distance. So... And a random question from the forum. What are some pieces of gear that you were skeptical, skeptical about that turned out to be awesome? Law folder. It took them probably to Gen 3 to unfuck it. But 
people need to throw that Gen 1, Gen 2 stink off of it because Gen 3 is fucking legit. Yep. I just got my second one in the mail today, actually. Yeah, I, I got about a thousand rounds through a uh, 10.3 inch gun with the Gen 3 on it and uh, absolutely nothing bad to say. I whacked a Havelina with it last week. Nice. Uh, I, I would uh, I, I would say that anybody that had um, Gen 1 PMAGs that had issues with them or whatever, it, it's kind of the same boat. The, the only commonality between Gen 1 and Gen 3 is the name PMAG. So if, if you haven't gone back to the well on that, um, you, you, need to, you need to give that shit another chance. Yeah. Great analogy. Mm-hmm. The only thing I think they could do is, uh, and we, we did that here, is just put a second spring nested inside the first for a little more uh, retention force in the folded position uh, to, to, as you pop it open, but that's like super minor. Yeah, I don't know too much else really that's out there that, that you know it's made just made just skeptical. I mean, there's there's enough you know knowledge now to weed through all that bullshit pretty fast. Yeah, that that question is pretty open ended. I don't, I mean, I don't know. Like coming over like our whole career, like what was some chintzy shit that was like, I don't know. Yeah. Anything from anything from Mako, Tapco, and UTG. <laughs> but oh, you're, you're not. I got to be good. No, no yeah. I got shit like a, in my closet. Like I could, you know, outfit a small, you know, third world country with some tactical shit that's just sitting in drawers, just because you know that's just what you do. You buy pouches and get rid of them. I mean, it's just if you ever want to get the first thing that you think is gonna work, that shit ain't gonna work. You're gonna find better, and they're gonna come up with something else better. Don't stick with your Vietnam era bullshit. Just get your stuff right and update. I mean, you know, just like you got to update your iPhones or your computers or whatever, you got to update your gear too. So, like, don't get stuck on something and keep it there just because that's how it always has been. Gear is an expendable item. It has its own service life. There's always a risk between being that early adopter and waiting too long to update. But just so, you know, the different personality types will be ready to upgrade or try something out earlier. But as long as as long as there's data behind it that you know, and you've you've actually run the stuff and you feel comfortable with it, there's a certain level, of, you know, of uh, of confidence there. I, I will, true confessions, no kidding. We were real skeptical of this drum magazine concept thing with the whole D60. Uh, just the idea of you know, that's hey, we wanted to do a 60 round. Uh, capacity solution and yeah okay we're gonna do this drum thing and based on previous drums none of us in in the in the product management group are real confident in that concept but that's surprised the shit out of all of us so we're 100 percent behind that thing I was really hesitant about the red dots on pistols um, one, I think the biggest thing for me was that um, the momentary glimpses of the dot I was getting because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a hard time uh, wrapping my head around it. And I was fortunate enough to get um, time with both Knipe and with Roland, and they broke it down for me. Specifically, Roland broke it down. And whenever I walked away from that, I was like, all right, I'm doing it. And, uh, I, you know, that was, you know, seeing how he addressed or they both addressed my issues without me even really speaking to my issues. And they spoke to it as though they had already cleared those hurdles. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably the biggest, the, the biggest purchase item, that I thought was maybe chintzy because I'd shot previous, you know, like I'd shot buddies like old, like what is it? The old aim point, the hexagonal tube aim points, like comp shooters used to run with like that 50 millimeter window. I'd shot all those old ones before, but um, I just had a real 
you know, it, that was a real leap for me to, to jump to that. But, uh, um, that's probably the last real big ticket I didn't that I was really just not, you know, a hundred percent on right up until the point of purchase. Look for the sites and the dot appears. Yeah. No kidding. Right. I got a question on that. So with like the guys that are instructing, like I don't run one because 99% of my students don't have them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So should we be forward thinking and showing them what you need or show, because like, you know, I train mostly law enforcement and I mean, everybody knows who trains out here. Most law enforcement dudes have iron sights on their rifles still. Mm -hmm. You know, and a red dot on a pistol is just like freaking. You know what I mean? So, why kind of spend the time doing it? What do you think? For my, I think, oh, I think you need the Roland Special. This right here. Oh. That's what you need. <laughs> I'm not. From my perspective on that, on day one of any class, I will always run an iron sighted gun just for to show that it's not it's not stupid human tricks that I'm doing when I pull out a red dot pistol and you know there's the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. It's just that the the increased capability of the dot is significant. So I'll, I'll do day one and I'll shoot and do demos with uh, an iron sighted gun. Not that I even teach that much anymore, but to show that there's that foundation there and it's not, it's not an equipment thing that's, that's uh, related to skill. It's just enhances that once the skills are there. Uh, I do it the opposite. Um, especially cause we normally start with, uh, some type of bullseye shooting eval. Um, and my eyes are going bad. So I will shoot my bullseye eval with my red dot and then we'll move into the other drills. And the first time that I hear somebody fucking say anything about the red dot on my gun, <laughs> stop what we're doing. I go grab a 35 or a 34 slide with a fiber on it. I fucking pull the slide off, whatever Glock I have in my hands, slap a long slide on it. And I go back and I fucking whip all their asses with iron sights. <laughs> and then after everybody's like silence on the range, I was like, okay, can I go back to shooting my fucking service gun now? All right, cool. That, that's how I handle that situation. Yeah. Um, it's not that I'm against it or, or for it. It's just, yeah, we just talked about mindset or the if the agency doesn't buy it, I'm not going to get it. And I couldn't imagine an agency buying, you know, $600. They're not buying them for rifles now much less their pistols. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, where do you kind of draw the line or not draw a line, but Hey, I'm going to bring what you have and I'm going to run what you, I'm going to show you the capabilities of what you have. If it's an agency, if it's a closed enrollment, the government is paying me, the county's paying me, the city's paying me and everybody in my class is a cop from wherever then I will try to do my best to have their service weapon for that, mm -hmm. that class. Cause that's just the right thing to do by those guys, you know, oh, yeah. 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 I have a Beretta so. for that reason. And that reason alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I won't shoot Berettas. So like, you know, if, if, if the, whatever police department tells me they carry Berettas, I'm going to give them Ernie Langdon's fucking phone number <clears throat> and I'm going to fucking say deuces. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious, man. I know what my lane is and my lane is not DASA fucking guns. I hate them. So I'm telling you, you need to get a CZ and knock that shit off. And that, that's probably why I have your old Beretta Elite too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just saying that I probably own that one too of yours. <laughs> hey Jared, I, I get what you're saying. That's your head's in the right spot as far as like setting that example um, with your well, they're your coworkers, but they're also your students. Um, there's another aspect to that whole argument, though, where um, you shouldn't show up with fancy stuff because that's not what the students need to see. And I've butted heads with bosses before over it because, like, I've showed up on the range for a class with my carry gun for a handgun one or a concealed carry course. And I just, I'm just going to run what I'm wrong. All I'm doing is I'm swapping out my carry ammo for ball. 
and you know, I've caught those comments before. And I, you know, I took it and I took it. And then finally I was like, you know what? No more. You know, why am I going to fake the funk, dude? I'm here to set an example. This is what I found works for me. And it's not just me. This is a new standard. And you can go to the Norwich study, which is right there on Trigicon's site. And you can read about it yourself. I have used my RMR with students, with agents on the government clock. I've used my Glock 19 to fix SIG shooters because they had so much shit going on in their grip that they cannot perceive it at the moment that the gun goes bang, they forget everything that led up to that shot. But by putting my RMR in their hand, now that doc's telling them the truth, it's telling them how ugly their trigger prep is, their grip, and their anticipation. They see it immediately, and within a few reps of just dry fire with my pistol, I can put my put their issue gun back in their hand, and they might break off one or two clean shots before the old habit screwed back up. Then I swap out the guns again. I get in 10, 20 minutes of work with them, and that's not wasted. That's actually building fundamentals back into the shooter. Um, they have their place in training. Unfortunately, it's underutilized, and it's driven by budget and dogma. Right, and, and that's, kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. And everybody would want them, I'm sure. It's just the that mentality, if they're not buying it for me, it must not be worth it type deal. And mm -hmm. you know, Give me my, what I need. My primary customer is law enforcement. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and even with law enforcement, you know, so let's say 60% of the guys there are law enforcement. And, of course, you know, the civilian side of it, they're more prepared than the law enforcement side. Those jokers show up RMRs because they're listening. Like, you know, they're on, like, forums like this or whatever. And they're like, hey, this, this shit works. And, but, and they'll see that it works, but just people won't do it <clears throat> until they get, until someone pays for it. They're like, Oh, that's cool. That's tiny. How much is that? And like, Oh, it's 475 bucks. They're like, yeah, all right. Oh. Mind, I'll stick to this. And that's to me, I don't like it, but that's just kind of the world I'm in. So I don't, I don't, I don't get out of it. If you had uh, some copies of departmental policies where they had, um, RDS, you know, RDS usage, um, you know, uh, the, these are the approved, these are why, um, you know, we're issuing these to officers over 40 that have stigmatisms um, because they're having trouble calling now or whatever. If you had some of those available when you did your LE classes, Jared, I think when you found that one or two, you know, kind of gun gear geek guys that are like, wow, I think this is an incredible capability and I'm willing to carry the champion, the flag back at my agency, help me. And you can say, Hey, this is Sacramento fucking PD's case study on RDSs. And this is, they've got all this data. They shot all these control groups and, and here's, here are the facts. Take that back to your agency. And then it just becomes a money issue. You're not having to fucking talk liability or reliability or increased performance. All of that data, all those metrics have been done by others. You just got to find that agency and have them hook you up with a copy of their study and then, you you know, make copies of it and have available for your students. And I think that would be a good way to open up the aperture on the agencies that can afford it or agencies that can't afford it, authorizing it for personal purchase within the left and right limits. So you don't have dudes buying, you know, bunk ass red dots for their service weapons, you know, having those control measures in place. Yeah. So like that's like with our department. So we issue rifles, but we don't issue optics for rifles. So, but there is a guideline for what optics you can use that the range will sign off on. So I, mean, I, I bet it'd be very similar to a pistol if you wanted to run an optic on it. I mean, guys on our team run optics uh, on their pistols and it's fine. It's just like, you know, like Jared, why aren't you doing it? And I'm like, because 99.5% of my students don't have these. So I can't, I don't, you know, I don't want to you know, fake the funk, but I want to show them what, that's the thing is I want to show them what the next deal is. And this is, you know, this is the shit I've shot them and it's the greatest, but I don't want to say, Hey, I'm doing this. Like again, why my gun was pure stock was because I don't want to say you shoot like this because of this. And it goes back you're caught in that conundrum kind of deal. You know, it goes back to that aspirational nature of uh, you know, mirroring the instructor uh, to me in a lot of cases in a good way. So now you've, you've got that, okay, this is the capability I am presenting to you. I can do what I need to do with, with irons, whether you do it in the front or in the back like Roland does. 
and and but here is what you're missing out on, and that opens a lot of eyes, I think, and giving folks a chance to to play with a little bit. Um, it goes a long way towards moving the needle towards folks adopting those things. Yeah. Especially if this is something that potentially will enhance and make you that much better, that much faster. Yeah, the, the reason why I'm so adamant about the, the RDS, uh, Jared, is is my last my last lethal force with a handgun was a, a rifle to pistol transition that occurred under night vision goggles. And I had a gun with fibers, and I was totally okay having fibers because I had an X300 on the gun. And I was, and I was always like, well, I'll just light them up because I'm thinking I'm going to be inside. I'll just light them up, silhouette the fiber front sight post uh, in the white splash on the on the dude, and tune them up. And the reality was is that I was being engaged outdoors. Uh, the person didn't know where I was at because I was still totally blacked out, and I ended up, you know basically point shooting, presenting the gun out of focus in front of my nods and, and just squeezing the trigger until I saw a bullet impact and then adjusting. And I, I didn't get a piece of that guy until like round 13 or 14. Um, and I, I think I finished that fight and I had two, two rounds in the magazine and one in the chamber at that point. So we went um, and started playing with red dots later on. And during our red dot testing, it was just a simple, we, we just did it for shits and grins was, Hey, let's see how these things work under nods. And I watched a dude run an eight second El Presidente, uh, all a zones clean, uh, under knots at 10 yards. And I was like, okay, this dude just made, you know, 12 a zone hits in eight seconds, completely blacked out. Um, that, that, that's a game changer for me. So I, I won't carry a duty pistol that doesn't have a red dot on it now. Um, and, and my classes are a little bit different because I'm very night vision heavy, so I can illustrate to tactical teams um, when their rifles are going down and they're having to look under their nods and now go white light on pistol outdoors uh, or pistol lasers or whatever their engagement technique is, um, you know, I can show them what, what having an RDS is in terms of being able to transition and still maintain the, the concealment of darkness. And then also I'll be the voice for Jim. Uh, he makes a good point that RDS equipped pistols are only going to become more common, not less. Mm -hmm. And I, I think so too. And it, that, that's the thing. It's not like getting on it, but I, I tell you, I have a hard time believing that it will become the standard in law enforcement. It will be. You think, I mean, think about like a, like only SWAT teams have uh, red dot optics on their rifles, typically, and that's a decent SWAT team. Like you know, I go around teaching a lot, and a lot of SWAT teams are running iron sights on their rifles. Or and over by me, uh, patrol officers also are running red dots. Mm -hmm. But are they buying them, or are they, or are they? That, that's my Oof. thing. It's, it's. It's the in between, like, and that's where I'm at, like, because our agency's larger. We have sixteen hundred, so we're not huge, but we're not small. We're in that in between where, like, small agencies can buy red dots, large agencies get money from the federal government to buy red dots. We're kind of right there in the middle where we're not getting anything. You know what I mean for patrol guys? And everybody knows red dots are the shit, and it has to get on there, but they're not doing it. So I just don't know. I know there's good and I know people should pay for it. And I would I mean, if you think about it as a policeman, I'd buy a red dot for my pistol before I buy one for my rifle, because that's probably the gun I'm going to use. Yep. There are, there are other method ways to get the equipment. Um, then part of the problem is like a department like yours and like my departments here are a lot smaller than yours. These are the, the, the very small, you know, counties and local towns with maybe three officers. Um, they only have so much money to get what they need. And so they try to get the most bang for the buck. And so they might only have allotted, you know, 1100 bucks, maybe 1500 bucks for a carbine. And so they try to get the best that they think they can get, which might only be an MP 15 sport. Um, but that's what they got. And so if it doesn't come on the gun, they're SOL. 
And so then it's on those forward leaning guys that actually have the disposable income or the overtime to pay for that actually invest in themselves and their equipment enough to slap on their own personally purchased stuff. Um, there are manufacturers out there um, that do the trade in program stuff. Um, I happen to work for one. Um, but there, I know there are others um, that anything that's like transferable that y'all might have in your vault, um, any weapons that are on 1033, um, that they take it, you know, straight value for value and try to build kits for what you need. Um, and so there are, there are methods and like we're working with a couple departments right now that they got some really cool stuff that they're willing to put on the line to get what their guys need. And, and so they're able to take those collector curio things that are really cool to look at and touch and shoot on demo day on the range but they're actually turning those things into real stuff that's going to be on the streets and going to be uh, force multipliers. So, um, you know, yeah. I, I'm sure that there, there might be a way to, to, to get you some stuff um, for y'all to be able to do square deal, nothing to blow board, but um, no, I'm not, I, I know not, there's several manufacturers that can do that. I don't complain about our agency. I mean, we, we, we're well, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we, we do well. I'm talking about like my agency, and that's like another thing, like how you're talking about like trading guns in. I get that. Like a lot of smaller agencies can do that. Like lar like mid level to large agencies, they don't do it because like they feel like the liability of trading guns. I mean, I, I get all that, but it is what it is. But with, it's just like to become common practice with dudes. Like I mean, I could see like SWAT teams going to RDSs on pistols and stuff like that. But is it gonna? I know it's going to become, but are people like, when do you see that happening though? Like, I mean, to me, like I couldn't see that happen before like 2025. Our buddy, five years. Our buddy Steve pointed out only SWAT teams used to have pistol lights. And you're right. And a pistol light is 150 bucks. You know what I mean? And you're not, I mean, you're talking, you got to go the money wise of it. And then, I mean, I, I mean, I get it, and I, 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 I want it to happen. To like, I'm not fighting anybody, but it just, I don't see it happening. I mean, I couldn't. I mean, red dots on rifles still aren't happening in my agency, and they're not. And I, and you could travel the country. I travel the country and teach the law enforcement all over. So many jokers don't have red dots on their rifles. And it's, that's what it is, and that's what they're getting, and that's what they're going to run because they're not going to spend the money for it. They're not going to do it. And I, could, I mean, I couldn't even imagine milling out a slide and putting our – like, and what's, what is that, a $600 investment at least? $700 investment? The, the big thing is right now is that the cost of the sites will start to see it come down, I think, to a degree – a little bit. I mean, some of the LE pricing is really good on them right now for agencies. It's probably almost half of what you're talking, depending on what units and where. But with, you know, like the core setups now, the, the Glock MOS, you know, so now you're getting away from having to actually have the cost of the guns milled. Um, I'm the Raven seeing, solution too. Yep, the Raven solution, the Baylor is, is great as well. And even, you know, the other one from Surefire, you know, the Dewick Defense, there's a lot of them out there now that are taking care of that, but, you know, it's still leading to duty holster issues with some of the moves. But I'm getting a lot of requests from departments for training right now coming through on the use of RDSs. They're, they're starting to become more prevalent. Guys are using them more. They're starting to see the benefits to them. And with some of the newer ones that are going to come out at uh, SHOT Show this upcoming year, it's going to get even more so. Um, the you know as as we've talked before, the cost versus you know the risk versus reward benefits, the the liability concerns, the increase in scores, times, hit percentages, the learning curves. There's no reason not to when you start throwing out the liability standpoint to them as well. You start but, to make an officer safety issue out of it, right? Well, there there is a, you can you can spin it you know ten different ways to the administration. I mean, the bottom line is still dollars. Obviously, but I'm seeing a lot more guys that are that their departments are letting them either do it themselves, and you know they're a very small percentage. Um, you know, I just got contacted by an agency out of Wisconsin. 
and another one out of Iowa, somewhere in Iowa that's looking to do it, you know, across the board for patrol. So, you know, I, I definitely think it's catching on. But I say three to five years, and it will be the norm. All right. Yeah, man, when you look at, like, um, when you look at uh, – you know, training deficiencies in handgun. Uh, one of the one of the biggest problems that uh, the reason why patrol officers have such abysmal uh, shooting um, stats in uh, use of force is because it's it's against human nature to after you identify the threat and that thing's trying to kill you to crank it back and look at your front sight. We can talk that shit on the flat range all day long, but. The reality is that these untrained officers, these officers in these departments that you're talking about that only qual, they don't have a training path. There's no way that you can calibrate Susan to stop looking at the fucking perp coming at her with the lead pipe and look at her fucking tritium. She's not going to remember it. She's going to fucking square that gun up and, and, uh, and try to superimpose that front sight on the perp. And the perp is what is in focus. As soon as you put a red dot on a pistol, that's okay for Susan. Because you're go, you're you have all the benefits of that rifle reflexology of basically removing uh, the, the the concentration on the front sight of your weapon to focusing on the target and just superimposing the dot. So I, I I'm not a big advocate of hardware solutions to software problems, but you know, it, is is if when you're trying to sell it to an admin, that that's an easy sale for them. Oh, okay. We don't have to come up with a training plan for Susan. If we're going to get these instant increases in hit probability, because she can use her current focal plane that she has hardwired in her shit. Yeah. So th that is, that is an example that has been used in other departments. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I get it, man. So don't think I'm against them. Like I'm on the, I'm on board with them. I'm just asked as a trainer side, like when, you know, when do you step out of bounds and, and go into where none of everyone who you're training had, like they don't have it. So why are, is anyone getting, so yeah, I'm running RDS and I'm doing things and no one else has it. Is anyone learning anything in the course? You know what I mean? Like that, that, that demonstration type thing. And yeah, they're learning, Hey, I should probably buy one of those fucking things, but you, you get what I'm saying. It, it's just, it's yep. just, it's the up and down with, with the training world. Like, yes, I want to be leading the pack, but I don't want to be, you know, so far ahead that they can't even catch up and they can't, and they're going to like, just write you off. You know, like some dudes will just write you off as soon as you have something like, Oh, he's got a red dot on his pistol. That, that's bullshit. So that's just kind of how that, I was thinking about that. You, you know what I do when I get those guys that do that, I hand them the gun and I'm saying, okay, show me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm always ready to go back to irons. Um, yeah, I, I had a a supervisor that was old school. Um, I mean, he wasn't in my element. He was a supervisor from another element, and he would not let any of his guys shoot red dots on any training day beer shoot you know, anything like that where, where it was a competition. He basically said no open class guns authorized, even though, you know, he had subordinates that that was their primary duty weapon. And he was saying, you can't bring your primary duty weapon on my range. This is an iron sights only training event or whatever. And so I, I knew that I had to have, you know, if I wanted to go there and, and steal all their lunch money, uh, I, I better have an iron sight gun in the bag, you know? Yeah. So, and I did. So that's just that's, that's just kind of where I was getting into it. I just don't know when departments are willing to eat the cost of doing it. They're going to start to see the benefits. Oh, the benefits are great. I mean, everybody sees the benefits, but whew. but like you know, you think about it now. They're they're trying to get people to not shoot people. So now you're putting a red dot optic on a pistol. You know, to make your your to you shoot better. I mean, it's just like, well, well, they're hoping that it never happens, rather than preparing for when it does happen. Mm. It's kind well, of the, it, the single focal plane is a great argument for that as well, because you can keep your eye on hands and exactly what's going on in a changing situation, 
right up to the moment of that trigger press without changing focus to a front sight or something is, you know, unrealistic as that may be, but it's still there. Yeah, that's a good point, Dwayne. So I think squeaky wheel gets the oil a lot of times on, on things as well. Um, does your department have a mandatory use of patrol rifles for uh, shots fired calls? No. Okay. So uh, B Bill, one of our mods, uh, in his, he's not talking about SWAT. He's talking about patrol. They have plate carriers for every patrol dude, and they have RDS-equipped rifles. If they respond to a shots fired call and there's more than one cop, one cop must have a rifle on to, when, they, when they respond. So they got one dude that can go hands on if it's a domestic, you know, drunk dude or whatever. And they got one dude with a long gun because they're showing up to some place that they already said something's going bang, bang. And it's, and when you made that mandatory that every patrol officer now understands it's their responsibility. Look at your buddy. Does he have a rifle? No, you have to have one. Um, that's what pushed the RDSs and the flashlights and everything else. Cause it's not just a rack gun that never gets used anymore. Now you have all these officers post event saying, Hey, it was dark out and I couldn't see my front sight. You know, I need one of those sites like SWAT has on this gun and I need a flashlight to be able to see in the bushes. You know, what, what the hell good? I got a, a light on my pistol. I ain't got no light on my rifle. And it's that kind of shit that gets you your slings, your white lights and your, you know, your red dots, the policy or the more aggressive use of the equipment is what's going to, is going to what it, that's what forces the evolutionary change. All right. And that's where I get into, we're big enough of a department that we have like a risk management dude, you know what I mean? And they're going to weigh that shit out. So is it worth the money to do it or the, to, to go against it. It's, it, it's, it's fucked up and it is what it is. And I don't want to argue against it because I think everybody should have the top equipment and, and do it in a policy, but we won't, we will never do, do a policy that says, Hey, you must pull your rifle out or you must not do it. Or, you know, actually we should probably have a policy that says don't bring your rifle out most of the time. Cause when we bring our rifles out a lot, you know what I mean? And, it, and that's just kind of how it is. Um, but I don't know. I was just trying to get to that side of the the RDSs on pistols is from a training standpoint. I mean, I see everything going out, you know, you know, I shoot them. I like them, but I'll never have one on the range with me when I'm teaching a class just because that's just kind of because no one else has one. <laughs> no, it's a solid argument. She got the question on the, what the current problems with the current crop or problems with the current crop of RDS and what will the next generation of RDS uh, sites look like. My submission to that would be, you know, as as we've already touched on, there is there are some durability concerns. Like back, you know, I'm 17 years old, running an open gun and run 50,000 rounds through a, the bottom of the line aim point, and now because we've slide mounted. Uh, that's a lot of G-forces right there. So uh, I think the durability is, is just the thing that always will be evolving. And battery life. And as, uh, as technology improves, I mean, it's, they're going to get better. They're going to get more robust. And if the, the price, price probably isn't going to come down any, but thankfully we have inflation, and so it's not going to seem like that much, maybe, right? I don't know. But definitely more manufacturers are probably going to start offering standard guns um, that are duty-ready uh, to accept a, a red dot. Um, just like more manufacturers are getting the, the big picture that, you know, yeah, we can sell a department and a gun, but our profit margins 10% on that gun and we're paying 11% tax. But if we actually include all the ancillary equipment with it, we actually make more money and they get everything they want. One point of purchase. Um, it's, it's smarter business all around and the end users get what they need and it shortens the logistics train. Um, and I, I guess I've gotten lucky with my RMR. 
I mean, it shut off on me a couple times, but that was telling me I needed to actually put it in a battery, <laughs> a new battery. I, I got left it on for like two years. Whoops. But I've only actually killed two, one on a nine that was at around the 8,000 round mark and one that I killed on a 40 super that was just complete jackassery and fly velocity. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh yeah, yeah. I've killed the, two two micro T's, uh, four RMRs, and more Insight MRDS than I can shake a stick at. Um, I've I've the doctor sites held up well for electronics, especially if you if you modified them. There was some some kind of jerry rigging you could do up under there uh, with putting a drop of silicone behind the leaf spring. Uh, so that the leaf spring didn't wear out and, and, and you lose battery contact. And then also putting a drop of silicone on the slide when you put it back on there and it actually glued the flat cell battery in place uh, to the slide so that it, did, it didn't shift around and reciprocate uh, inside of that thing. But the doctor had no uh, protective hood. It had no uh, edges like the Churchcon RMR where, it's, where they looked at impact resistance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had a doctor on my Sims pistol and I dropped it from holster height onto a concrete floor and shattered the glass. Um, so, you know, not, not ready for prime time, um, you know, for a duty pistol whatsoever. That's definitely a, a kind of a gamer or high end uh, type of site. Um, I, 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 th I think we could potentially see uh, some type of element within the industry, whether it be a firearms manufacturer or an RDS manufacturer that uh, attempts to make some type of industry standard for footprint. Because right now we've got this whole post for J point, we've got this whole post for RMR, we've got this whole post for, you know, these other ones. Um, and, and so that forces firearms manufacturers to make adapter plates. And when you make adapter plates, the, the, the site sits up higher off board than, than you would want. And the higher up off board is the harder it is to get a natural point of aim based on trying to pick up your regular sites. So uh, I could see somewhere, you know, five, six years down the road where. Uh, oh. And just another point to edit. Great. <laughs> now, the other thing with adapter plates and everything, anything that raises the, the line of sight over the line of bore, any just magnifies the stress on that optic as well. So, yeah. Physics, physics is a bitch. I just need to put key mod on the top of the slide. It'd be good. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's one advantage that I have right now, working as close as I am with Trigicon on everything that they're doing, uh, being able to get you know test fixes in hand, and just literally taking them to the range and just beating the shit out of them on a handgun. You, you know, either forty-five, nine mil. You know compact m and 40 is absolutely horrendously vicious on those things. And I'm lucky enough to get out to be able to just beat the dog snot out of them through, through the evolutions as, as they're starting to find, you know, fixes and working materials and things like that. Um, you know, what the way to saying too, you know, the higher up they go, I mean, you know, the physics behind it is just stupid. All the problems that we don't think about, then we go, oh, wait a minute, this is probably why with this, this could be with that. Um, a lot of it has been issues with a lot of companies has been their suppliers and they change equipment, electronics, you know, midstream. I've seen that companies haven't been told about it. And next thing you know, they see this big increase in customer service RMAs based on that. And they're like, hey, what's going on here all of a sudden with these lots? I'm like, oh, we changed it mid stride on you. <laughs> because we've done X, Y, or Z. It's like, well, that's not cool, dude. You need to put that shit back. And what we're working before needs to keep working. I've, wow. Yeah. Like, I have personally killed, I know personally I've killed two T1s. I've killed, you know, six 
seven RMRs that I just keep, you know, getting back, recycling, rechecking, you know, adding new upgrades and fixes to. Um, deltas have killed a couple of those, the, the, you know, the loophole delta points. Um, I still, my brain housing unit you know, just keeps telling me, like, I ran the old Trigicon Dr. J points for quite a while uh, prior to the RMRs coming out. I still think that a lot, and we didn't see any of the issues that we we're seeing today with the new electronic optics that are out with the red dots. I still think a lot of it had to do with that doctor's body housing, that that polymer plasticky body housing was handling the stresses a lot better than the current crop of metal bodied sites. And I can't confirm, deny, or figure that out somehow, some way, but I think that was probably one of the best options at the time. Progress. Mm hmm. That's like what, 7,000 G's in an RMR? Uh, more. <laughs> depending, on the gun, depending on the gun and caliber. Smith and Wesson did a big test on it and sent some astronomical numbers, especially in the compact guns. Are they, are these cast housings? Um, depends on who and what I know. Let's see, who's using a cast? Is it a Trigicon Magnesium forged or is it cast? It's a forged. Okay. It's a forged. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of it too is the tolerances, the way they're fitted to the guns help. Oh, yeah, like what Doug yeah. does. Oh, yeah, Doug does an amazing job on those things. It's... He actually pretty much match fits them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if, they, if they could fix just their tolerance controls fore and aft for that and their hole placement that they could get those ironed outwards more consistent then they the gun companies could actually probably commit more to doing it um, if you did a near net know. forging and then machined uh, you know the final pass on the front and rear contours of that thing right adds to cost but yeah and that's what I was saying about uh, an M lock style. I wasn't saying we put M lock on a gun. I'm saying that M lock was an industry standard that if you were to, if you said, I'm going to do M lock, you must use their TDP to their spec. Whereas key mod, key mod is not key mod is not key mod. So, so some type of, of industry standard for footprint on that slide. And now optics manufacturers know you must contain your shit within this footprint. Because all the slide companies are going to be fucking making their removable plates to, to this these dimensions. Right, so on that yeah. note, while Matt's chewing, I think I'm going to sign off, gents. Thank you, Wayne. Take it out. Thanks for man. joining us, man. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Don't be a stranger. You know it. Later. 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 All right, I think I'm gonna get out of here too. I'm gonna hit the hit the bed. Good times, and if I'm invited back, I'll come do it again. Anytime. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, seriously, anytime you want to come on, you open invitation. All right, guys, I'll check y'all later. Yeah, appreciate right. it, Jared. Thank you. Okay, he's gone. We can talk about him. God, he's got the stupidest looking. Oh. <laughs> What's the guy got to do? Get shot in the face around here to get some bag full of stuff? <laughs> yep, he's coming back. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he was cool. Like I don't, remember, I think it was Wix that sent me a message saying, "Wow, he's basically saying everything that we say." Well, yeah. <laughs> That might have triple digits on viewing. Mm. No, it's just all my devices simultaneously. Yeah. Well, should we call it? Your call. Roland? I'm unintended, we, man. We yeah. can cut live if you want. Yeah, we can, we yeah. can do that and uh, just keep it rolling, just not live. Yeah, yeah. just w wrap it up, you know. That's what the good stuff is. You guys have any... Uh, Final notions, final comments? Mm -mm. I know Jim has a lot to say, but he can't. <laughs> it's killing him. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, um, that should do it. That that was a that was a good time. Quite educational for I'm hoping everyone involved. You can find us at primaryandsecondary.com. We have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com backslash forum. We are on all over social media. Lots on Facebook. We have like 80 groups, something like that. Um, and we're not going to be doing these every night, but we're going to do these often enough where it's going to be fun and it'll be somewhat usable, hopefully, for people. So with that in mind, thanks.